a service of KIBMRadio.com, the Internet's home for an all-old-time radio. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, minus four, minus three, minus two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand would be worlds. The National Broadcasting Company presents X, 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 X minus, minus, minus one. one. Tonight, Universe. are just beginning to discover how boundless our universe really is. And yet as man reaches out to the stars, out toward infinity, ironically enough, he may be building himself a new kind of prison. What would it be like to live all your life in a world no larger, say, than a single gigantic rocket ship bound on endless mercy? Look out! Are you all right? Yes. Just missed me. What was it? A mutant with a slingshot, I think. Must have dashed down that passageway. Want to go after it? No, we'd never catch it, Alan. Probably 12 decks above us by now. I didn't think they ever came down this far. Trolls usually get them before they reach this level. They get more daring with each generation. This one looked like a female. Uh, male or female, it might have killed us. I told you this trip was pure foolishness, climbing 24 <laughs> deck levels to hear a crazy old man rave. All right, Alan, we're almost there now. Let me see compartment X, 15, level 24. Now, this is the place. This area smells as if it hadn't been visited by a sanitation crew for generations. Mm. Well, this part of the ship is almost deserted. Yes? Is this the compartment of John the Witness? Who are you? My name is Hugh Hoyland. Cadet from Scientist Barracks. This is my friend Alan Mahoney. What do you want of John the Witness? Well, only to talk. Are you a believer in Jordan? Naturally. I have heard that there are those among the younger scientists who doubt the word of Jordan. To doubt is death. We are not heretics. Ah. Enter. I brought you a gift of tobacco, grown on the richest level. Oh, it smells good. I assure you, it's of the best. Wait here. I'll get him. What a rat's nest. Shh. Well, what the devil do you think he can tell you? Alan, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Well? Are you John the Witness? I am. Good evening to you. I'm Hugh Hoyland. This is my friend, Alan Mahoney. What brings a gentleman of the scientist class to my humble compartment? I've heard that you and your parents before you have been keepers of the legend of the ship. Since Jordan gave the word. I'm anxious to hear the word as Jordan spoke it. Why? Because our young scientists, well, among them there have been some who talk against the word. There are regulations against such heresy. Still, some of them say the ship has no purpose. They say that we are here accidentally, that we have no more grace in Jordan's eyes than the most deformed mutant who dwells in the highest level of the ship. What shall I say to you? Well, I wish to hear the word from the mouth of one who knows, in order that I may become more convinced. Sit. You have a gift for the witness? The finest tobacco. Good. 
I will dim the lights. Now pay close attention, for these are the words as my father's father's father gave them to his son's son's son. This is how the ship came into being, how our people were created. In the beginning there was only Jordan, thinking his lonely thoughts. Out of his thoughts came a vision. Out of the vision came a planning, and out of the planning came decision. Jordan's hand was lifted, and the ship was born. Mile after mile of good compartments, tank after tank for golden corn, ladder and passage, door and locker fit for the needs of the yet unborn. He looked on his work and found it pleasing, meet for a race that was yet to be. He thought of man, and man came into being. Then Jordan checked his thoughts and searched for a key. Man untamed would shame his maker. Man unruled would spoil the plan. So Jordan made the regulations and order came to the works of man. A crew he created to work at their stations. Scientists to guide the plan. Over them all he created captain, made him judge of the race of man. Thus it was in the golden age. These are the true words? As my father's father taught them. But what of the strange beast-like people on the upper levels of the ship? Surely Jordan did not create them. Jordan is perfect. All below him lack perfection. You have heard of the legend of Huff? I have heard that he mutinied against Jordan. Darkness swallowed the ways of virtue. Sin prevailed upon the ship. And before wisdom prevailed and the bodies of Huff and his followers were fed into the converter, some of the rebels escaped and lived to father the mutants. They are tainted with the sins of their fathers. Witness, one more question. Speak. What is the ship? The ship is a great sphere. Twenty-five kilometers wide and one hundred levels deep. I know that, but the upper levels... Regulations forbid us to venture into the upper levels, but it is said that beyond the levels of the mutants lies the forbidden place where Jordan's spirit prevails. So I've heard, yet something troubles me. Something which prompted my coming here. Yes, my son. What lies beyond the ship? What? What lies beyond the ship? This is heresy. Answer me. I will not permit such talk. The ship is complete. The ship is universal. The ship is everywhere. The, the ship is endless. Your mutterings is... are those of a frightened old man. Oh. They answer nothing. You, you question the word? I think you lie. Hear me, Mr. Hoyland. For what you have already said, I can have your body fed into the converter. Your soul launched on the endless trip. You threaten me. You, for Jordan's sake. Do you think I fear this dried fig of a man? You... Sir, my friend is impetuous. He, he does not understand. I might be persuaded to forget the, the substantial gift. Why, you pig! You! Alan, come on. The sight of this so-called holy man offends me. No, you shall not leave. Don't try to frighten me with that gun, old man. Remain where you are, heretic. I warn you, put down that gun. No, 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 no closer. Drop it. No, very well, then. Death to the heretic. Alan, get him. No. Alan, he's not breathing. Is he dead? I, I, I don't know. Come on, Hugh, we've got to get out of here. Right. Nowhere. We can't go back. They'd feed us into the converter before we could even... What's that? An alarm. That old woman must have turned it in. Come on, Alan, the patrol will be here in no time. Where can we go? Yes, where, where? The upper level. No, the mutants. We'll have to take our chances. Come on, Alan, let's go. Listen, that's the patrol. Come on, we've got to climb. There's a hatchway. It's on the corridor. All right, quickly, quickly. Oh, oh there we fire. Alan, Alan, up ladder. Up. Come on, Alan, come on. Phew. Phew, wait. Wait. How far are we from the outside wall? Uh, judging... Now the slope of the deck. About two miles. Well, let's try this passageway here. 
If you hadn't asked him that stupid question... Now, there's no use going over that. But why did you do it? I've been thinking about it for a long time. When he began to give me those stupid, pat answers. And I just saw red, I guess. Who are you to question the ways of Jordan? When you asked me to go with you to visit the witness, I... I thought you wanted spiritual help. I, I never I'm dreamed... I'm sorry, Alan. I'm sorry. I couldn't foresee this. Wait. Wait a minute. What? I, I saw something move. Where? Near that bulkhead. I don't see anything. Maybe my eyes are going bad. Ah! Oh, listen! Kill me, Highness! Alan, look out! No. What? what are you? Uh, 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 that knife. Keep away from me, you. Uh, don't kill him. Not yet. Who are you? You must forgive my friend Bobo. Like so many of my people, he's rather impetuous where members of the so-called super race are concerned. Who are you? What place is this? I can guess. From my leg. I'm a mutant. Mutant? Where? Where is Alan? Your friend is dead. Dead? I was not able to restrain my people in time to save him. Why don't you destroy me and get it over with? We do not kill for pleasure, Mr. Harland. Only when necessary. You know my name? I read your identification tag. Who are you? Mutants can't read. My name is Gregory. Gregory? I'm a leader of my people. You see, although we are unfortunate in our heredity, Mr. Harland, many of us are quite intelligent. And why do you live like animals? We'd rather live like free animals than like regimented slaves, as you do. I've heard you practice cannibalism. Undoubtedly, you hear many things about us. You turn your head. Why? That... that monster. I've never seen a creature like him. Bobo is an unfortunate. He was born without the power of speech. How can you tolerate such a monstrosity? You've learned to live with difference. If we began to destroy our imperfects as you do on the lower levels, there would soon be no one left. It violates the regulations. The word of Jordan. You know, State of Ireland. Your people are really quite primitive and barbaric. You dare say that to me. I dare say a good deal more. Let us go to my compartment and speak further. I'm always interested in information on the lower levels. I'll give you no information. Bobo. No. I want Mr. Hoyland in my cabin, please. No. No. I advise you to go quietly, Mr. Hoyland. Bobo has a hatred of superior beings, which is unfortunate, but quite understandable. <laughs> Proceed. Enter, Mr. Hoyland. This is where you live? Yes. But you have books. Stolen from your libraries, Mr. Harland. Compton's Astrophysics, Philosophy of Interstellar Navigation, Celestial Mechanics. You've read these? Most of them. I had no idea that you... Why did you bring me here? What do you intend to do? Do you believe in Jordan, Mr. Harland? There is no other belief. And the trip. I suppose you believe in the trip, too. What else is there to believe? When you die, your remains are fed to the converter, and your soul makes the trip. And where does the trip take you? By the Centaurus, of course. Ah. And where or what is Centaurus? Centaurus is... Mind you, I'm just telling you the orthodox answer. Centaurus is where you arrive when you've made the trip. A place where everybody is happy and where there's always good eating. And you believe this? Well, the peasants believe it literally, but many of the younger scientists, like myself, know it is figurative and symbolic. Why do you ask? Did it ever occur to you, Mr. Hoyland, that the trip is exactly what your peasants believe it is? What? And that the ship and all the crew were actually going somewhere, moving? The sh ship can't go anywhere. It already is everywhere. Imagine a place bigger than the ship. Much bigger. bigger. With a ship inside it, moving inside it. There can't be any place bigger than the ship. There just wouldn't be any place for it to be. Oh, for half's sake, listen. You know the lowest level... Of course. If you started digging a hole in the lowest level, where would that hole go? It's forbidden to think such thoughts. Where would it go? I can't think about it. Bobo. 
We're going to take Mr. Hoyland to the place. No. Where, where are we going? To the top level. But that's sudden death. Nonsense. I've been there a thousand times. Come along. No, I won't. I won't. You can't make me. I think we can. <laughs> Please. Now, shall we proceed peacefully, or shall I have Bobo persuade you? <laughs> Open the door, Bobo. <laughs> Inside. Oh. What place is this? This, Mr. Hoyland, is the main control room. Oh, Mr. Hoyland, you're trembling. It isn't true. No. No, there's no such place except in mythology. Ah, you younger men are so wise, Mr. Hoyland, except for one thing. This happens to be the main control room of the ship. Main control? But it's just a huge room with an instrument panel. And what did you expect? How do you know this is the main control room? See these instruments? Using them, the navigator many hundreds of years ago actually steered the ship on its voyage. I don't understand. I didn't suppose you would. Sit down. Very well. Look up. What do you see? A huge shield. Watch it for one moment, Mr. Hoyland. You're going to see something that few of us have ever been privileged to witness. What are you doing? I'm dimming the lights. Don't be frightened. Keep your eyes focused on the shield above us. Ready? Watch. <gasps> it's sliding back. Ghost of Jordan. What am I seeing? The universe, Mr. Hoyland. The universe in all its beauty. The stars, the planets, the suns and moons and constellations. No. No, it can't be. The ship is the universe. There is nothing but the ship. Ah, but there it is. You see it before your eyes spread out like a canopy of glory. Do you still deny it? Answer me, Mr. Hoyland. Do you deny it? No. No, I can't deny it. They've lied. They lied to all of us. Good. I have showed this to others of your people whom we captured, and though they saw it before their very eyes, they would not believe it. Please. Please tell me all about it. Tell me the truth about the ship and about the universe. What are these things? How did this come about? Many thousands of years ago, on a planet like those you have just seen, a planet called Earth, a scientist named Jordan decided to build a ship that would carry men from one planet to another. For many years, Jordan and thousands of others studied and planned. And when they were finished, they built the ship. A ship so large that it had to be assembled in its own orbit beyond a place called the moon. Sixty years it took them to construct. And when it was finished, a whole new science had been conceived. Then the trip was begun. The trip that was to land a colony of Earthmen on a far-off planet called Centaurus. Millions of light years beyond the furthest planet ever reached before. How do you know these things? Among my books are the log which Jordan himself kept and the records of the journey for the first 40 years. What happened? There was a mutiny. A man named... Half led a rebellion of those who wanted to turn back. In the struggle, the navigators were killed. And the crew fell into a state of anarchy. In the years to follow, small groups of men tried to organize the ship for navigation, and each time they failed. Finally, the whole idea was abandoned. And so, for centuries, we have swung in space, unmanned, undirected, living in a lost world of our own making, without purpose, without direction. Why have you told me this? Can't you guess? You want to finish the trip. Yes, but I can't. You can't? Look at me, Mr. Hoyland. You see, a mutant, a man with a twisted leg... My people are outcasts, condemned to death if we so much as set foot in the lower levels of the ship. 
The main drive is in the lower levels where my people are forbidden to go. No. It would mean that both our people would have to work together. Our differences encouraged rather than denied. All right. I'll see the captain himself. I have an uncle on the central board. I'll tell him what I've seen here. And do you think he'll believe you? Send one of your people with me. That's asking a good deal. I'm risking a good deal by going back. Very well. Bobo will go with you. Bobo? He can't talk. There will be no need for talk. I will write a message guaranteeing safe conduct for a group of unarmed scientists to visit the main control room. Bobo will take you safely through our territory. What happens when you reach your own level is up to you. One moment. Yes, what? You. Quick, Uncle. Let us in. Hey, but this, this mutant. He's harmless. Please, Uncle. Please. Now, what is this? You want it for... I know all about that. Uncle, listen. I must see the captain. The captain? Are, are you mad? Uncle, you're a council member. You can get me to see He'll him. He'll kill you. You're one of the heresy. I don't care. I must speak with the captain. Now, Uncle, you're close to him. You can arrange it. I don't understand. Listen to me. The ship is moving. I can prove it. Do you understand? There is a purpose in the ship. I don't understand what you're battling about. Now, never mind. Just talk to the captain. Tell him I have information of tremendous importance. Tell him I've arranged a truce with the mutants. Truce? Here. Show him this paper. Signed by their leader. Do it, Uncle, for my sake. I don't know what... To... Uncle, please, if I'm to die, let this be my last request to you. Very well. I'll speak to the captain. And you say, Mr. Hoyland, that you saw this with your own eyes? I swear it, Captain. I swear it on the word of Jordan. Hmm. Uh, let me see the paper again. Manderist, what do you think? I don't know, sir. It might be a trick. I guarantee you safe conduct. If these things are as Mr. Hoyland reports them, it would pay to risk a few lives. A man is a convicted heretic. Still, we must not discount his word. He has a safe conduct, and the mutant risked its life coming with him. I think we might investigate. Captain, you mean you will do it? I will have an expedition outfitted. Dismissed, Mr. Hoyland. Thank you, sir. Captain Green. Commander Erst. Sir. You will make the necessary arrangements for an expedition. And I trust you understand. Perfectly, sir. Perfectly. <laughs> Hey, you better hurt your men here. This is the spot. Patrol! Huh? Well, I see no welcoming party of mutants. <laughs> There'll be none. Their leader will meet you inside the main control room. You don't say. Just where is this main control room? Beyond that door. I see. All right, man. Ready up. Lieutenant, why do you ready arms? In case of ambush. Ambush? Now, wait a minute, Lieutenant. What are those men doing with that ray gun? Just aiming it at the door. Are you mad? No, Mr. Hoyland, but most certainly you are to think that we could be lured up here to be slaughtered with a fantastic story about some mythical control room. Guns ready, Lieutenant, sir. Lieutenant, I warn you, these people have acted in good faith. You can't break that faith. Oh, mutant! Come out! For Jordan's sake, Hold Lieutenant! It. Why? For comfort. Mutant! Open the door! Please, Jordan. Don't let anything happen. Don't let... Are this opening? Ready, men? Someone's coming out. Steady. Gregory, stay back! Fire! You fools! You've killed him! Here come the rest of them. Fire! Fire! A 
touch it. Teach them a lesson they won't forget. All right, men. Inside the room. Hello, Harlan. You're under arrest for a conspirator in this ambush. Ambush, you fool. You blind, stupid fool. All right, that'll be enough. You've been inside this place before? Yes. What's this machinery? These are the controls he would have used to steer the ship. Gone out of his mind, Lieutenant. Steer the ship? Who? The leader, the one you killed. <laughs> this ugly mutant? This ugly mutant. Happened to be a man of true genius. Why, well, you're mad. Am I? Lieutenant, this man had a vision which would have saved you, but you chose to kill him because you couldn't stand the sight of his difference from you. Shut up, Highland. Don't listen to him, man. You can't shut your eyes and you can't shut your minds and you can't shut your ears to this. <laughs> Back. Yes, look. Let the vision of this confound your ignorance and blind your eyes. This is the heritage of stars and open skies for which men have yearned for centuries. Try to destroy this, and you will only destroy yourselves. Death to the heritage. I. I, I say to you that you can't keep this from our people. They, they will seek it out. The ship will be manned, and the ship will be steered, and there will be freedom, purpose, and respect for ourselves. This is your heritage. Look, look upon the universe. Kill him. Minus One has just brought you Universe, a story written by Robert Heinlein and adapted for radio by George Lefferts. Heard in the cast were Donald Buca as Hugh, Peter Capel as Gregory, Bill Griffiths as Alan, Abby Lewis as the woman, Edgar Staley as the witness, Jason Johnson as the uncle, John Seymour as the captain, and Ian Martin as the lieutenant. Your announcer is Fred Collins. X-1 is directed by Fred Way and is a transcribed NBC Radio Network production. And now, next week, next week we have a strange story to tell. A sweet, blood-curdling middle story that is really only two sentences long. The last man on earth sat alone in a room. And then, there was a knock on the door. What knocked on that door? You'll find out next week on... X. Minus... One. One. When you buy United States savings bonds, you help to build your own future security. Here's an opportunity to save systematically for long-range personal objectives. So invest in United States savings bonds. Now follow the Abbots to mystery and adventure over most NBC radio stations. Countdown for blastoff. X minus five, minus four, minus three, minus two, X minus one. Fire! From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future. Adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand would-be worlds. The National Broadcasting Company presents X minus one. Tonight, the science fiction classic, Knock, by Frederick Brown. Tonight we have a strange story to tell. 
A sweet, blood-curdling little story that is really only two sentences long. The last man on earth sat alone in a room. There was a knock at the door. Hmm? What's that? Good morning, man. What? Who are you? You have regained consciousness. Who are you? I am Zan. I'm still asleep, I must be. You are not asleep. Maybe if I close my eyes, it'll go away. I will not go away, man. No. I guess I'm awake. Who... What are you? I am a Zan. What's that? A Zan is intelligent life. Look, I don't... What happened? Where are you from? From planet seven in the third galaxy in the fourth quadrant. Where? It is not necessary to repeat information which is correct in the original statement. Planet seven, but... You mean I'm not on Earth? You are still on your planet. Then what are you doing here? The Zans have annexed your world. You mean you've conquered Earth? Yes, that is correct. We will now prepare your planet for habitation by the Zan. Well, how about the people? What about the population of the world? You are the population of the world. Hmm? Now, wait a minute. I, I can't... I don't understand what's happened. The Zan have landed on your planet. We have removed the lower life forms to prepare for colonization by the Zan. When did all this happen? Two days ago. You have been unconscious until now. You really mean I'm the last man on Earth? That is correct. Identify yourself now. What? Kindly provide data as to your position in the elementary social order of your planet. Oh, well. I'm uh, Walter Phelan, Associate Professor of Anthropology at Nathan University. How do you speak English? We have deciphered your written and recorded records. It is not difficult to reconstruct your language. It is a primary type of auditory communication. Oh. Is there anything you want to complete your natural habitat? You mean I'm a prisoner? That is correct. What would you want further in your room? Do I have to stay here? Yes. The rest of my life? Forever. You better bring me my books. Uh, that there will is... be done. That's rather considerate of you. You know, I've got to call you something. Do you mind if I call you George? It is immaterial. I will be back, Associate Professor of Anthropology. Oh, that's all right, George. Just uh, call me Walter. Very well, Walter. I will be back with your books. All right, George. I'll be seeing you around. You will not be around, Walter. You will be here. <laughs> George. Hello, Walter. Uh, wait a minute, you're not George. You're different somehow. It makes no difference. The sun are many, and they are one. Then I'll call you George, too. I'll call you old George. Uh, what can I do for you? Point one. You will please henceforth sit with your chair facing the other way. Uh-huh. I thought so, George. That plain wall is different from the other side, isn't it? That is correct. It is transparent. Yeah, that's what I thought. I'm in a zoo, right? That is correct. How many other animals do you have in the zoo, George? 216. <laughs> Not complete, George. Even a bush league zoo could beat that. Did you just uh, pick at random? Yes. All species would have been too many. Male and female, each of 108 kinds. Male and female, huh? Of uh, all the animals? There is a female of your species among the collection. Mm, anyone I know? Uh, well, never mind. It doesn't matter anyway. Well, uh, what do you feed us all, eh? For carnivorous species, we make synthetics. The flora was not hurt by the vibrations which destroyed animal life. Oh, nice for the flora. Well, George, you started out with point one. I deduce there is a point two kicking around somewhere. What is it? Something we do not understand. Oh? Two of the other animals sleep and do not wake. They are cold. Don't worry, George. It happens in the best regulated zoos. What is wrong with them, Walter? Nothing much. They're just dead. Mm -hmm. That means stopped. But nothing stopped them. Each was alone. Well, maybe they just died of old age. Old age? I do not understand. You don't? How old are you, George? 
Your planet went around the sun about 7,000 times since I was born. 7,000 years? Yes, I am still young. Yeah, babe in arms. Look, George, you've got something to learn about this planet you've hijacked. Here on Earth, we've got somebody you don't know where you come from. An old man with a beard and an hourglass and a scythe. Your vibrations didn't kill him. What is he? Oh, old man death. Down here, our people and animals live until somebody, the Grim Reaper, stops them. He will stop more? He gets us all, George. With your lifespan, it won't seem like a minute and we'll all be gone. <laughs> Looks like you made a mistake, George. And I don't think there's much you can do about it. That is not correct. The Zan is a logical being. We will take action. Oh, George, uh, where are you taking me? We will be there shortly. We will bring your books and your chair. You mean my lease is up? I, I do not understand. It's moving day? That is correct. We are here now. You will live here now, Walter. It is a larger room. Well, be it ever so humble, there's no place like home. Go inside. Oh, be careful with those books, George. Don't lose my... Oh, uh, excuse me. Who, who are you? What are you doing here? I guess George didn't explain. Uh, George uh, tries to be polite, but he hasn't quite caught on yet. I'm Walter Phelan. My name is Grace Evans, Mr. Phelan. What's all this about? Why did they bring me here? I think I know why, but uh, let's go back a bit. Do you know just what has happened otherwise? No, not exactly. Well, I've been talking to George. George? Well, that's what I call them, all of them. There's no way to tell them apart anyway. There aren't many of them here yet. They come from outside the solar system, sort of an advanced scouting party. I saw their spaceship. It's as big as a mountain. Yeah, they're moving in on us. They cleaned off the Earth with some kind of vibration. It destroys all sorts of animal life. I don't know whether they did it all at once or if they had to circle the Earth a few times, but they killed everybody. No. I was afraid The cheerful note is that you and I and uh, 200 odd other animals were picked up beforehand as specimens for the zoo. You do know this is a zoo, don't you? I suspected it. But I don't remember anything about being captured. I just woke up here. Well, my hunch is they used the vibrations just low enough to knock us all out. And then they cruised around picking up samples at random. When they were all set, they turned the juice on full blast. How terrible. Yeah, well, they solved a lot of problems for us. Housing shortage, wars, even the atomic bomb. I don't suppose the human race, you and I, have to worry about anything now. It's awful. Only they made a mistake. They underestimated us. I don't understand. <laughs> they thought we were immortal. But we were what? Immortal, like they are. Oh, they can be killed, but the Zans don't know what natural death is. They didn't know anyway until they lost two of us yesterday. You mean there are, are more than two of us? Oh, not more of our species, no. These were merely fellow animals, a rabbit and a canary. And by the Zan's way of figuring time, the rest of us are only good for a few minutes apiece. It's a joke on them. They figured they had permanent specimens here in the zoo. Well, didn't they even know we'd all die eventually? I don't think so. Uh, George, that is the, the second Zan I saw, told me he was 7,000 years old, and he's young by their standards. When they learned how quickly we die, they, they were practically shocked to the core, if they have cores. How can you talk that way about it? Academic detachment. I learned it at faculty tees. At any rate, they decided to reorganize their zoo. Two by two. What, are they going to keep us locked up together in this one little room? Yeah, I'm afraid so. There's plenty of furniture, though, and George promised to bring me my chair. We've got to do something. Why? Well, I don't know. It just, just seems to me we ought to the human race to do something. Oh, well, uh, perhaps you have a suggestion? There must be some way. They can be killed, you said. Oh, yes, sir. I've been studying them. They look horribly different, but I think they have about the same metabolic and digestive system as we. I think that anything that would kill one of us would kill one of them. But you said 7,000 years. Yeah, I, I think I figured it out. Now, George cut his, uh, I suppose you'd call it his hand, when he brought in my books. Started to bleed, red blood. But I could see the cut closing as he stood there. By the time he left, it was healed. I don't understand. Well, you see... Whatever factor there is in man that makes him grow old is missing in the Zan. Their regenerative powers must be unlimited. They just don't wear out. They go on and on until they're stopped. Suppose we killed one. There must be some way. Oh. What would be the use? 
They wouldn't even punish us. They'd just give us our food through a trap door and put up a sign saying, Beware of the man. Dangerous. I don't think they'll even have to bother in your case. <laughs> I don't see anything funny. I'm sorry. It just reminds me of Martha. Martha? My wife. She died two years ago. I'm, I'm sorry. Well, not at all. It was a pleasure. Uh, that'll be George with my books. Come in. Hello, George. Hello, Walter. Point one. I have brought your books. Mm-hmm. Point one, eh? Uh, what else is on your mind? Another creature sleeps and will not wake. Oh? A small feathered one called a duck. Well, it happens, George. I warned you. Old man death, the grim reaper. I told you about him. Walter, the Council of Zan has met. It has been decided logically that A, no life form can withstand the full strength vibrations with which we cleared your planet. Therefore, the grim reaper you spoke of does not exist. Mm, pretty neat, George. What's B? B, the only intelligent life to escape the vibrations is you. Therefore... The logical conclusion is you are stopping these animals by some means unknown to us. George, you are off your trolley. You will tell me now how this is done. You've got me. Yes, we have. It is necessary to save the remaining specimens as long as possible. If we do not get the information, we may be forced to dispense with your species entirely. This means you, Walter, and the female. Now, hold on, George. Don't go off half-cocked. Uh, let me take a look at these animals that won't wake up. I will take you there now. Go first, Walter. After you, my dear George. This is the weasel. Now, you should have got him in the winter, George. The fur is worth more than its ermine. This is the reptile cage. Mm -hmm. Here are the ducks. That is the male. The female has been stopped. Yeah, lucky girl. What's the matter, fellow? Lonely? Hmm? Walter, you will tell me how you stopped the female duck. Oh, you got me, George. I didn't do it. Maybe she died of the Dutch elm blight. Walter, you are not being logical. We have concluded you are stopping these animals. Tell us now how it is done. I've told you, George. I haven't the foggiest notion. Very well. We will have to take further action. Oh, what are you going to do, George? We will go back now to your room. What happened, Mr. Phelan? Uh, you might call me Walter. After all, George does. And we have more in common. Please, what happened? Oh, just a duck, a dead duck. George thinks I killed her by remote control. He wants me to tell him how. Did you? Look, I'm just an ordinary anthropologist. There's no telling what those animals died of. Just natural causes. But George can't see it that way. He thinks I'm holding out on him. Good. Hmm? What? At least we can get back at them some way. At least we can do something to them. Well, why? After all, George isn't a bad fellow, if you like an ant mentality. How can you say that? Well, they murdered the whole in the human race. I suppose so, but uh, we can't change that now, so why think about it? We just can't sit here and do nothing. I fail to see how we can do anything else. But at least we could be fighting. I can't see the virtue in that. I was more or less content with my books, and we've got George to talk to. Of all the men in the world they had to pick... Don't you want to fight back? Don't you want to keep on fighting to the end? It hadn't occurred to me. But we've got to, Walter. Why? Well, I can't really explain it, but, Walter, if there was any good in man, it was that he kept on struggling against nature and, in the end, even against himself. But he kept on fighting for what he thought was right, and we're all that's left. Walter, we, we just can't end by giving up. We've got to keep on fighting. You know, you do remind me of Martha. There isn't much left for us. We could beat them in this one small thing. We can pretend there's a secret about death. We could refuse to tell them anything. Well, there isn't anything to tell. But they don't know that. Promise me you won't give in. Well, I suppose the worst they can do is kill us. All right, Miss Evans. Hello, George. Hello, Walter. Now you will tell us how these animals are stopped. George, this may come as a shock to you, but... I've decided not to tell you. Why? Oh, a romantic attachment to lost causes. My grandfather was a Confederate officer. Walter, you are not being logical. Neither was my grandfather. He charged a Yankee battery with one round of ammunition and a corncob pipe. You are not logical, but that is expected in lower life forms. You will come with me now, Walter. Where are you taking him? To the second level. Go now, Walter. He won't tell them. I can't guarantee anything, but as of now, I don't intend to. We've got to fight, Walter. Remember that. We've got to go out fighting. Yes. Yes, I think you're right. Go now, Walter. Goodbye. 
It's uh, been a pleasure, Miss Evans. I am waiting. Go now, Walter. After you, my dear George. You will tell us now, Walter. Uh, <sighs> that was the first level of vibration. There are many more. However, we have calculated that none of them exceed your threshold of unconsciousness. Oh, very clever, George. Of course. You will tell us now how do you stop these animals? You will tell us now? As of now, no. However, I'm not very brave if that encourages you, George. You are not being logical, Walter. You're telling me. We will now use vibration level two. <laughs> Let me alone, George. You will tell us now. You will tell us now how you stop the animals. Let me alone. Let me alone. We have had vibration levels one and two. There are still 15 more before your threshold of unconsciousness. No, no, no. Let me alone. Walter, listen to me. Another creature sleeps and will not wake. We must know now. It's tough. You better start vibrating again, George. No. What? It would not be logical. We have calculated that no further level of vibration will overcome your irrational psychological block. We conclude you will not tell. And let me go? That is correct. Oh, that's uh, real nice of you, George. I appreciate it. We have calculated that the resistance of the female of your species will be lower. We will now place her under the vibrations. No, no, no George, George, you can't do that. No, listen, George. George, there is no secret. Can you understand that? There is no secret. Those animals died from natural causes. I'm telling you the truth. That is not a logical answer. We will get the woman. I've told you the truth. Can't you understand? We must know now. The female animal cage next to the duck has been stopped. We must preserve the survivor. But the animal... Animal next to the duck? We will bring the woman here. She will tell us after the vibration. No, no, no. no, no. Listen, George. You want the truth? You want to know how to save the mates of the animals that have been stopped? You will tell us now? Yes, yes, I'll tell you now. I, I give up. But you've got to promise to leave the woman alone. You promise, George? If we receive the answer from you, Walter, there will be no further need for the vibrations. Well, I guess that'll have to do. All right. All right. Take me to that stopped animal. I'll tell you how to save the mate. Very well, Walter. You are being logical now. We will go. <laughs> Walter, are you all right? Just uh, let me catch my breath a minute. What did they do? What happened? After a while, I told them what they wanted to know. Oh, no. As uh, George pointed out, it seemed to be the logical thing at the time. But you promised. I know. It was our last chance to beat them on even one little thing. Well, perhaps. You mind if I sit down? You gave up. I suppose you could call it that. I'm very tired. They've beaten us completely, then. There isn't even anything we can do. The last of the human race, and we give up. We don't even die fighting. Oh, it isn't that bad. Uh, Something might turn up, Martha. What did you call me? Uh, uh, Huh? No, I I must have said Martha. Sorry, she was my wife. She died two years ago. What were you saying? Nothing. Nothing. It doesn't matter. It's too late. It's too late for the whole human race. What now, George? The council of the Zan has met... Oh, something wrong, George? A Zan has been stopped. What? A Zan is dead? That is correct. Well, you didn't believe me, George. But you can die. You can really die. You'll have to get used to that if you're going to stay here. The council has decided. A, you have in some way stopped this Zan. B, you and the woman must be eliminated. Walter. No, no, you've got it wrong, George. The council has decided. This time you will have the full vibration. This time? Walter... What did they do to you? Oh, they, uh, they have a rather effective third degree. They tortured you, Walter? Yes. And I... I thought... Oh, Walter, it was all my fault. I wouldn't even have tried without you. I suppose we have a last chance now to, to end with some dignity. I think you're a very brave man, Walter. No, not very. There isn't much else to do. Do we go now, George? No, Walter. What's that? I have been told 
Another Zan has died. Now, now will you believe me? The Council of the Zan meets now. Two gone already, and you were with me, George. You know I didn't kill this one. What stopped him then? I told you, it's old man Beth. You came to the wrong planet, George. Your immortality doesn't go down here. He can stop you, but you can't stop him. And you'll all die if you stick around. What now? The council has decided. This is a place of death. We will leave your planet. Leave? You mean you're giving up? It is not safe for the Zan. Oh, Walter, they're leaving. They're really going. Go on then, George. And uh, don't hurry back. It would not be logical to do so. We are leaving the Earth now. Goodbye, Walter. Goodbye, George. Well, they're all aboard now. So wonderful to feel the sun and the wind again. Yeah, they've closed the hatches. Walter, is it safe for us to be out here? Yes, they're not interested in us any longer. They only want to get away. And I want to see this, Grace. The Zan leaving Earth forever. They're blasting off. There they go. Yes, it's all over now. Well, I suppose we might as well go back in. I, I still don't understand. Walter, what made them go? <laughs> Well, I just uh, I just told them the facts of life. Of death, you mean? No, no, of life. After all, I thought George was old enough to know. At 7,000 years, he was getting to be a pretty big boy. I wish you'd stop joking and tell me what happened. Just look out for the step. Well, uh, you remember when the first animals died? The rabbit and the duck? Yeah, and their mates just started to pine and waste away? Yes. Well, that worried the Zan. They wanted to keep the last specimens alive if they could. So, finally, I broke down and told them about affection. Affection? Yes. And then I introduced Donald. Donald? Who's that? Here we are. Grace, meet Donald. Oh, Walter, please. What does affection have to do with it? That's what the Zan wanted to know. I told him it was love that made the world go round. That having lost his mate, Donald would die immediately unless he had affection and constant petting. Petting? Hmm? I even showed him how. Here, fella, come on. Come here. I held Donald in my arms, and I petted him a while. Then I let the Zan take over with the animal in the next cage. What animal? Take a look. You mean this cage? Mm -hmm. Watch out. Don't go too close. Walter, it's a rattlesnake. Yes. Their metabolism made it impossible for them to die of old age, but I had a hunch that they could be poisoned. Then it was the snake that killed the two Zan. Mm-hmm. They never even knew what bit them. Then you outwitted them, Walter. Well, I, I suppose... I you... thought you'd just given up. Oh, Walter, I'm so ashamed. You don't have to be. I had given up. I probably wouldn't have fought if you hadn't pushed me. Well, I... Well, we've got a world to plan. A new world, Grace. I know. We'll have to decide which animals to let out of the zoo and which ones it'd be safer to keep in. But first, there's a bigger problem. What's that? The human race. Oh. We've got to make a decision about that. Pretty important one. We, yes, but... It's been a nice race, even if nobody won it. Of course, it may go backward for a while until it gets its breath, but we can save the books and all the most important things and get it started ahead once more. No. It's the Garden of Eden all over again. Uh, but Eve... You'll have to watch out for that snake. Now, don't. Don't be ridiculous, Walter. You know, funny. You, you even blush like Martha. Only uh, you're stronger than she was. Prettier, too. I, I, I wish you'd forget about Martha. I think I will, my dear. If you'll give me time. Now, Walter Thielen, you listen to me. If you think for one minute that I... Well, that I we... thought it would never happen to me again. But it is love that makes the world go round. So, Grace, if you could only... No! I wouldn't marry you if you were the last man on earth. But that's exactly what I am. I don't care. I don't even want to talk about it. I'm going out. All right, my dear, but think it over. And please come back. You see, I told you, it wasn't really so horrible... Our story. 
Remember how it goes? The last man on earth sat alone in a room. And then there was a knock on the door. Come in. Come in, Grace, my dear. You see, it wasn't horrible at all. In just a moment, a word about next week's adventure. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you Knock by Frederick Brown, adapted for radio by Ernest Kinoy. Featured in the cast were Alex Scorby as Walter, Laurie March as Grace, and Louis Van Ruten as the Zan. X-1 was directed by Fred Way and is an NBC Radio Network production. Now, next week. A strange and chilling story from the Bureau of Missing Persons. The story of what occurred when they accidentally intercepted a shortwave message. A cry for help from a missing atomic scientist who told them the fantastic story that he was now the man in the moon. How did it happen? You'll hear next week at X minus one. Join the Abbots on another baffling mystery tonight over most NBC radio stations. The Magic Island of Euclidea provided enough surprises for any party of adventurers. Now, the colony of Euclidea, the larger part of this weird settlement, promises to be even more surprising. Jerry and Joan found a lot of interesting things when they explored the Magic Island. They found complete scientific laboratories, submarine docks, and immense power machines inside the artificial island, built to a depth of 100 feet below the surface of the ocean. Now, Jerry and Joan have started out to explore the colony of Euclidea. We find them standing on a balcony, 300 feet below sea level, looking out over an immense cavern, in which the activities of an entire community are being carried on. But gee whiz, Joan, I don't see how you can be so calm about all this. Is there something exciting about it? Is there something exciting about it? Look, Joan, here we are, standing on a balcony bill of steel. We're 300 feet under the ocean, and the bottom of this cave, or whatever it is, is more than that. Hey, but look what's going on down there. I see that, Jerry. There are trees growing, as you have said, and vegetation of various kinds. But why should those things not grow here? Because it's in a cave. There's no sunlight here. And you can't grow things without sunlight. I think your statement would be more sensibly worded if you said that in your limited experience, you had never seen these things growing without sunlight. It can't be done. You may see with your own eyes that it is being done. Well, I still don't believe it. Come on. Let's go down and see some of these things. I think there is a stairway over this way. Yeah. And I'll bet it's a good long one, too. We must be 200 feet above the floor of that cave. It is approximately 200 feet. Oh, Jerry. What? This small stairway will do us no good. No good? Well, it goes down, doesn't it? It does for a few steps, possibly 12 feet. And then the steps end in that small landing. Well, golly, whiskers. What good is this kind of a stairway? I think we may as well descend as far as possible. At least we may be able to see under this balcony. Perhaps there are other means of reaching the floor of the cave. Okay, we'll get down. But I don't see what good it's going to do us to stand on that little platform and wish we were 200 feet below here. There is only one means of support visible for the platform. Yeah, and they're not any too visible. Just those four wires hanging down from the roof of the cave. 
I wonder if it's safe to step all on it. To be sure it is. Yeah. Well, we're here. What good does this do? We have gained nothing. This is simply a platform suspended below the balcony. But it must be here for some purpose. Well, maybe. I don't understand it. Jerry! The stairway. Hey, it folded back out of the way. And that sure leaves us in a swell spot. Here we are on a little platform 200 feet in the ground hanging on four wires. And we can't get back to the balcony. Jerry, we... We are sinking. Huh? Yes. Observe the wall under the balcony. Fix your eyes on one spot. Are we not moving? We sure are. We're going down. And without a sound. This platform must be an elevator. It is not. This platform is a platform. Okay. But if it acts like an elevator, it is an elevator. At least we descend. I'll say we descend. We're going down, too. Jerry, descend is synonymous with go down. All right, all right. We'll each do this trick the way we understand it best. You descend, I'll go down. We will reach the bottom. Will that suffice? Mm, That'll be all right with me. One nice thing about this elevator platform, it goes nice and slow. We are approaching a good view of the floor of this cavern now. Boy, some of those trees must be a hundred feet high. We're nearly down to them, and we're only about halfway. We are not more than one-fourth of the way. The height of those trees is more nearly 150 feet. And these Euclidians can grow trees 150 feet high in a cave under the water. Perhaps the scientists will explain that to you, Jerry. Well, I'm going to ask them anyway. G-47 said we could ask all the questions we wanted to, within reason. And one thing I sure want to find out is where all the light in this place is coming from. That is an intelligent question, Jerry. Well, look who thought of it. Exactly. That prompted me to wonder at it. Oh, is that so? Now, Jerry, you must not become angry. I think you are a very clever boy. Oh, you bet I am. Nevertheless, the answer to your question would be obvious to you if you were slightly more clever. Huh? Oh, do you know the answer? To be sure I do. The light comes from the roof of the cave. Oh, I know that. But how did the light get up there in the first place? What makes the light? That you will have to ask Thales. Thales? Oh. Well, I don't want to see anything more of that fellow. Thales is the electrical expert for Euclidia. Any question on illumination will be referred to him. Well, then maybe I can get along without the answer. I'd rather not find out than ask that fellow anything. Hey, Joan, we've stopped moving. I had noticed that. Look, Joan, we've been moving along pretty fast here. Oh, not as fast as one of the regular elevators in the island. But we've come down about a hundred feet in three or four minutes. Now, this platform was hung on those wires on the corners. But when we stopped, this platform didn't sway around. It didn't move like it was swinging on wires. And it hasn't moved yet. That is strange. Are you sure there is nothing supporting us from below? Nothing but the air. That looks kind of thin to me. Something is being used to hold this platform perfectly motionless. Well, other things are moving, even if we're standing still. What is moving? Well, look over there at the wall of the cave. Yes. A portion of the wall is moving. But what a strange action. It looks to me like a long, narrow strip of the wall is opening down toward us, like one of those drawbridges they used to have in front of castles. I am watching it. A section of the wall directly opposite this platform is opening, and the metal section is coming down within an arc, which should terminate at the exact level of this platform. That's the way it looks, and that's a pretty good long piece of steel, too. We must be 40 or 50 feet from that wall. Jerry... Someone is walking out along that narrow strip of steel as as it comes down into place. And they're not waiting for it to get all the way down, either. Hey, look out, Joan. Get back from that edge. I will not be struck. There is ample room. Boy, they sure know their engineering on this place. Our platform never even shivered when that steel drawbridge fell into place. Is this not the submarine commander, Jerry? Yeah, it looks like her. But she's turned around looking at the wall, and I can't be sure. Yeah. Well, now she's looking this way. You will follow me. You mean us? Of course she means us. Oh, I just wanted to know. Okay, Commander. Here we come. Oh, noiseless steel in the strawberries, too, huh? You have learned little since our last meeting, Hall. What's the matter with me now? You will persist in asking questions to which it is not worthwhile to reply. I will attempt to curb Jerry's questions, Commander. Oh, you will, huh? You might use your time in some more profitable pursuit, Cleostra. There's that Cleostra business again. Her name is Joan. Joan Gregory. And that old stuff about her namesake who monkeyed around with a Zodiac and fixed up the calendar doesn't mean a thing to her anymore. Look, Joan's been to Los Angeles with me, and she likes our way of living. So from now on, that's the way she's going to live. You may find, and that in the very near future, that your life on Euclidia will be more pleasant 
if you conform to the Euclidean manner of doing all things? Oh, sure. We're smart enough to play your way when we're using your marbles. But when we get back in our own yard, then we'll do it our way. That is the mistaken impression I am trying to correct. You will never know any other life than this. You will never leave Euclidia. Jerry, I believe she speaks the truth. Maybe she thinks so. But that's because old G-47's got her scared. That is partially true. Everyone on Euclidia lives in fear of G-47 and his displeasure. Yet even such a life is preferable to anything your world could have to offer. I have seen something of the world of which Jerry speaks. I think you would change your opinion if you could see it as I did, Commander. Oh, you sure would. Why, a girl as beautiful as you are with the right kind of clothes, I could be a picture star in no time at all. A picture star? Jerry refers to the more important personages in the world of the motion picture. You are obviously sincere about this matter, Hall. Is there anything more attractive than being the first in command of the Euclidean underwater fleet? Well, that may seem like a swell job to you. Well, I guess it is. But it's no job for a girl. Why, one of these scientists should have that job. And you ought to be back in Hollywood, knocking them dead in the flickers. Jerry, I am sure the commander does not understand a word of that. It was not even partially comprehensible. Okay, okay. What I intended to convey was the impression that a young lady of your beauty ought to be in Hollywood with the rest of the stars. But you spoke of killing someone. It is not the policy of Euclidians to take human lives. I didn't say anything about killing anybody. But you did, Jerry. You distinctly said knocking them dead. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, maybe you didn't understand me then. That means that you'd get over big. Make them crazy about you. I didn't think you were swell. You'd be the tops. Won't all that. I believe you intend to compliment me on my beauty and infer that my appearance would be productive of approbation and homage in the making of motion pictures. That is what Jerry meant, Commander. Oh, well, maybe it was. It didn't sound like that to me. Enough of this. You will continue to follow me. We are following you at the moment. Yeah. I wish you'd lead us on to something that would make a little noise when we walk. I'm getting tired of having my footsteps sound like toothpicks falling on a rug. You will have many opportunities to hear a variety of sounds during your stay in Euclidia. We are now leaving the steel walk and entering the chamber wall corridor. Oh, I can see that. But how about closing that thing again? It will close automatically. Did you stop the elevator we were riding on so that you might meet us at this level? No. That platform would descend no further. It is merely used for observation of the floor of this particular chamber. You might have stayed there all day if I had not noticed you. Well, where are you taking us now? Where I supposed you were trying to take yourselves down to the floor of this chamber. Commander, you continually refer to this chamber. Are there others? There are twelve others. Thirteen Thir in all. Thirteen? Oh, boy. What is the matter, Jerry? Oh, nothing. Only I hope they discover another one. Are the others much smaller than this one? The others are all much larger than this. Larger? Twelve other rooms under the ocean and all larger than this? Precisely. This is slightly less than one mile in diameter. The largest chamber in the city is two miles wide. Gee whiz! A cave two miles wide. Will we get to see all those other places? I believe that is G-47's wish. Though your conduct will have much to do with permission to continue, I will leave you here. Continue down this spiral passageway. You will reach the floor of the chamber. I will meet you later. Do Jerry and Joan are now several hundred feet below the surface of the South Pacific Ocean. After the Gregory party was comfortably located in their new quarters in the Euclidean city below the sea, Mrs. Gregory and Captain Bradford started out to explore the underwater colony from one side, and the youngsters chose the other. When they stood on a balcony of steel, looking out into a natural cave nearly a mile in diameter, where large trees and green grass were growing below them, Jerry and Joan thought they had seen something wonderful. Now, however, they are seeing things even more wonderful as they stand on the floor of the immense undersea room. Hey, Joan, listen to that. Listen to what, Jerry? Listen, you'll know what to listen to. I hear a variety of strange sounds. What do they mean? Well, if it was back home, out in the country, I'd say we're in somebody's barnyard. Sounds like chickens and stuff to me. I have never heard of chickens. Well, you're hearing them now. I don't believe it. Jerry, you say you can hear something? Then you say you do not believe it. 
What are you thinking about? Well, I know there couldn't be any chickens or ducks or pigs or, or any of the rest of those things here. We're in a cave 400 feet below the water. But you said you heard those animal sounds. No, I still don't believe it. Jerry, it is foolish to stand here and discuss something we may easily settle. Well, how can we settle it? If we step around this section of the wall into the main chamber, we will see what is making those noises. Yeah, guess you're right. Okay, come on then, Joan. Hey, Joan. Joan! Listen to the noise our feet make here. What is so strange about that? Well, this is good old dirt we're walking on now. Just plain old ground. Boy, it sounds good after all that noiseless steel we've been walking around on. I can understand how you would feel that. Joan. Joan. Look, it's, it's a regular barnyard. Just like we have back home, any place in the country. What are those lively white things? Those lively white things are chickens. White leghorns. I have eaten a chicken, but I have never seen one before. Did you like that bacon we had for breakfast? It was indeed acceptable food. Well, that old guy over there with a the curly tail, that's a pig. And someday he'll be bacon. Will he also be eggs? Will he be what? Will the pig be eggs? We had eggs with the bacon this morning. Look, Joan, you don't get eggs from pigs. You get eggs from chickens. It's about time you start eating some real food instead of that concentrated stuff they give you in those little pills. Huh. Eggs from a pig. I am sorry if you think I am stupid, Jerry, but I had never seen either a chicken or a pig. Oh, okay. But don't ask me a lot of silly questions now if you see a cow. A cow? What is a cow? I know it. Now hold everything. I'll explain a cow when we see a cow. I suppose you think milk comes from those concentrated milk tablets. That is indeed all I know of milk. Well, it strikes me that a lot of these Euclidians know plenty more than you do about a lot of things. Somebody's been living down here and taking care of all these animals and birds and stuff. Jerry, what is stuff? Oh, stuff is, well, when you're talking about something and you mean a whole lot more that's pretty near the same thing, well, that's stuff. A larger quantity of nearly the same thing. Hey, look who's coming. He is vaguely familiar to me. Well, I guess you only saw him a time or two when we first came here in your mother's yacht. That's the old skipper who was handling the boat. The old gentleman who speaks only a single word at one utterance? That's the guy. And he's got some funny-looking clothes on. Looks like he's working here. That is indeed the Euclidean laboring dress. Well, back home, we'd call him overall. Hey, skipper. Jerry, perhaps you should not speak to him. Why not? Old G-47 said we could do anything we wanted to on the sightseeing tour. He has heard you, Jerry. He is coming toward us. Boy, and does he look glad to see us. Hello, Skipper. Hello. How do you do? Hello. Have you been here ever since we escaped from the island? Yep. Have you been working down here? Yep. But you are a sea captain. What did you know of farming? Nothing. Well, you must be doing it all right now. You look like they were treating you pretty good. Aye. Is McLeod the Scotch engineer down here, too? Aye. What's he doing? Milking. Milking? Milking. You mean milking cows? An engineer from a yacht milking cows? Aye. Oh, I'll bet he doesn't like that any too well. What's your job, Skipper? Pigs. Pigs? Hogs. Oh, boy. I can see that engineer handling a bunch of pigs. Jerry, what is a hog? Oh, a hog is a pig. Then what is a pig? Oh, a pig is a hog. I do not understand that. Oh, never mind now. Save all the questions till some other time. Just now, I want to try and find out something about what's been going on here. Have they treated you all right, Skipper? I mean, plenty to eat and a good place to sleep? Aye. Can we see McLeod pretty soon? Aye. Jerry, would it not be quicker and easier to see these things for yourself than it is to wait for the captain's answers one word at a time? Hey, look here, Skipper. Why don't you open up and do some real talking? I mean, put two or three words together and make a book out of them. No. Why? What's wrong with talking like other people? Waste. Waste of what? Words. So it's too much of a waste of words to tell us what's happened since we've been gone. Yep. Do you know where McLeod is? I mean, where we can find him right away? Pigs. Yeah, I know. He's with the pigs. But where are the pigs? Gone. The pigs are gone? Aye. Well, where do they go? I know blame well they can't run away from down here in this place. Where are they? Sleep. Oh, the pigs are gone to sleep? Aye. Jerry, if they are sleeping, we do not wish to disturb them now. Look, Joan, a pig is something you don't care whether you disturb it or not. A pig can sleep any old time. A pig, well, a pig is just a pig. Possibly, but the skipper says the pigs are asleep. And I believe he means we cannot see Mr. McLeod, who is caring for them at this time. Is that not correct? Aye. Well, of all the blame nonsense I ever heard of, I can't visit the guy who's watching the pigs because the pigs are sleeping. Fine thing this is. It's a wonder the chickens aren't taking a little nap. Feeding. Oh, you're feeding them now? Aye. I should like to see that, Jerry. 
I have never seen a chicken eating. No. No what? You mean we can't watch you feed the chickens? No. What is the objection? Orders. Orders? Regulations. Regulations? Boy, I pretty nearly had you there. That word's long enough to count for two. May we see them closely at some other time? Aye. Hey, Skipper, come back here. Busy. Oh, I like that. He's the old Skipper, one of your mother's and Captain Bradford's best friends, so stuck on his job feeding Euclidean chickens that he can't even stop to talk to them. Perhaps he's only executing orders, as he said. Well, maybe, but it wouldn't hurt his old chickens any if we watched him feed them. Have you thought that G-47 may have some secret regarding the feeding that you may not see? Oh, I suppose so. Well, come on. The old skipper's closing that gate, so we might as well walk around the edge of this place and, well, see if we can get a look at a cow without spoiling her game of checkers or whatever they have the cows doing here. Jerry. Yeah? Do you not see how very final all this is? Final? What do you mean? That old gentleman you call the skipper. He is of your world, a good and loyal friend of my mother's. Oh, sure he is. Why? Yet his appearance is that of a man who is very happy. Quite content with his lot, satisfied with this life. Yeah, well, I guess he didn't seem very excited about seeing us, but then he never gets excited about anything. I meant more than that, Jerry. He is intelligent, has seen much of the world, and knows what various things are worth. Yet he is content to remain in Euclidia. What are you trying to say? I am afraid that may happen to all of us, Jerry. Is it not entirely possible that we may all find life here so pleasant that we will not want to leave it? Mother and the captain and yourself may be quite willing to give up the world you have always known. And I will have to be content with the brief glimpse I had of that world. Oh, don't worry about that, Joan. I'll never like this place so well that I won't want to get back home. I wish I could believe that, Jerry. Well, I mean it. I know you mean it at the moment. But we do not know what wonders we may see here, what comforts may be provided for us. Will we ever go back to your world, Jerry? Now, quit worrying about things like that. And let's find out more about these big caves. This one looks like it's the farm, the country part of Euclidia. Where are the rest of the caves the girl commander told us about? When we were up on the balcony, I could see the opening into one of the other rooms. But from our position on the floor, I can see nothing but trees. Trees? 200 feet high. Boy, what a place. And on this side of us, the artificial steel wall of the chamber. And now we're back in that noiseless steel again. And I suppose a lot of the spooky Euclidean stuff will start happening. Oh, I knew we couldn't have pigs and chickens all the time. Must you walk so rapidly, Jerry? Well, why not? There's nothing to see around here, and I'm in a hurry to get where I can see something. You will see a great deal. Gee whiz. G-47, where did you come from? That is not important. You will follow me. Oh, okay. Come on, Joan. No. Cleostra will remain where she now stands. You mean I'm to go with you alone? Precisely. What shall I do? Remain in your present position. Mrs. Gregory and the captain will join you in an instant. Oh, but look here. Why can't Joan come with me? You said we could look at anything we wanted to on this island or under it. I will show you something far more interesting than anything you might discover for yourself. But where are Mother and the Captain? Silence, come all. I won't be long, Joan. I I have spoken. That is all. Yes, that is all. And I am alone. Alone in the same world from which Mother and the Captain and Jerry have tried so bravely to remove me. Joan, dear. Mother! Where's Jerry? And are you all right, Joan? Oh, I am perfectly safe, Mother. But where did you come from? Through this steel slide right behind you. Why, it's invisible now. Why, sure it is. Once you pass through a door in this place, there's no chance to find it again. But where's Jerry? G-47 just stepped through another of those noiseless steel panels and ordered Jerry to accompany him. What was he going to do with Jerry? That I do not know. Oh, probably ask him a lot of questions. Jerry doesn't know the answer to the only question old G-47 cares about. I hope he can make that scientist believe him. I suppose we are quite helpless to do anything for Jerry. Naturally, Mother. And any attempt on our part to move in Jerry's behalf would only anger G-47. Well, we might as well take it as calmly as we can and wait around near here for him to come out. What have you two been seeing? We saw the old captain of your yacht, Mother. The skipper? Yes. How was he? He seemed in the best of health and spirits. So obviously so that Jerry could not understand it. What was he doing? He was caring for the chickens. Chickens? Yes. I had never seen one before, and we did not view these from a good point. 
But Jerry said they were chickens that gave us the bacon which we used with the eggs which came from the pigs to make our breakfast. <laughs> well, Joan, dear, that's the first time I've ever heard you so completely mixed up. But I believe we understand. You mean that they have chickens and pigs here? Just beyond this soundproof wall. Jerry and I saw and heard them from a distance. And the old skipper is caring for the chickens. What a task for an able seaman. But you say he seemed to enjoy it, Joan. He did indeed. Of course, it is difficult to question him as he will only speak a single word at one time. But he excused himself and left us very calmly to attend his chicken. Tex, can you imagine such a thing? No, I can't, unless it would be McLeod milking cows. As to that, I could not say. But he is attending the pig. Tex, McLeod and the pigs. <laughs> a marine engineer and his skipper playing nursemaid to the pigs and chickens. <laughs> no wonder Jerry looked surprised when he heard that. Not follow me further. Now, step into the incredible, amazing future as we go exploring tomorrow. And now, here is your guide to these adventures of the mind, John Campbell, Jr., night as I was going up the stair, I met a little man who wasn't there. He wasn't there again today. My gosh, I wish he'd go away. I knew Gillette Burgess, who penned those immortal lines. Uh, how do you get rid of a little man who isn't there in the first place? Well, uh, Peter Manson was a physicist, a scientist. And uh, his trouble started with a little man who wasn't there. Submatrix X integrated to pi over 2 plus confound. May I come in, Mr. Manson? Oh, why? Well, for Thank service. you. Are you alone? Uh, yes. Well, then she hasn't arrived yet. I wasn't expecting anybody. Oh, I am, but if she isn't here yet, I'll have some time to explain. Who is it? Well, one thing at a time, sir. Now, first, have you ever considered the problem of time travel? Time travel? Why, that's impossible. Oh, now don't say impossible because you invented it. I've done nothing of the sort. History says you did. What history? History says that you invented time travel machinery and applied for a United States patent on June 16, 1964. What history? That's six years from now. Ah, but not from my point of view. You see, I've used one of your own time machines to come back from your future. Fifty years through my past, to this date, your present. Do you understand? You claim you have traveled 50 years through time? I am here. That's proof. I don't believe a word of it. Well, look them over. This is your own personal notebook, 50 years later than it is now. Actually, that's the same one that's on your desk right now. Now, this is a copy of your patent. Now, these documents say I'm right. I say so. You see, in my day, you are the wealthy and famous Peter Manson. Well, do you want my autograph? Uh, you may be right, but I'm not wealthy yet. Oh, I'm not after anything. I'm here to help you. I don't need any help. Do you know the first thing about your future? Of course not. Well, I do. I know just about everything that you're going to do in the next 50 years. Prove it. What am I going to do next? You are about to be introduced to the woman who will become your wife. I already know her. We're engaged. Oh, you mean Laura Phillips. Well, no doubt she's a nice enough girl, but she's not for you. You'll break that engagement shortly. I'll do no such thing. Hendry says you did, not will do, did. But you... Yes. Yes, Laura. No, Laura, not... But, Laura, Come on, we... tell her now and get it over with. You shut up. No, Laura, I didn't mean you. No. No, Laura, she's not here. No. She hung up. Oh, wouldn't look to you, huh? And that's your fiancée. Uh, she wouldn't do that, huh? Uh... Is, uh, this, uh... Oh, uh... Miss Carter, now, we've been expecting you. Please come in. Well, all right, but just for a minute. No, Harry, you wait by the door, but stay close. All right. Now, um... <clears throat> Uh, Miss Amelia Carter, may I present... Get that dame out of here. Dame? Please, now, this is hardly a way to start a lifetime. A lifetime? Right? Yes, history says so. Fifty years and still going when I left. Now, stop this hostility. 
You might as well save time, too, now. Now, start off with the first names. Amelia, this is Peter. Peter, be nice to Amelia. You really should be gracious, generous, anxious to create a good first impression. Don't tell me how to behave. Don't you blow a fuse, Grandpa. Grandpa! I am Peter Emil Manson III, your grandson. A note that the middle name is the masculine form of Amelia, your wife, my grandmother. Grandmother? Yes, indeed. Your son is my father. But I'm not married yet. Oh, but you will be. Now, Grandpa, you sit here. Cut this Grandpa stuff right now. Well, I'm sorry, but I've been taught that it, it, it's impolite to call my grandparents by their given names. Of course, you don't look much like the old duffer that I know as Grandpa. Oh, now, Grandpa, Grandpa I'll... Calm down and you start making like romance. You know, you're not even engaged to Grandma yet. Don't uh, call me Grandma! Oh, no, pardon me, it, it is impertinent, but you are quite a dish. Uh, now that I've seen you in your youth, I, I can understand why Grandpa threw over this Laura Phillips girl. I can hardly believe that you'll become that sweet little old lady. Mr. Matson, what's he talking about? He's a time traveler from the future who says he can prove that we met, got married, and... Now, don't call any further. I'm afraid he's right. He says it's history, and we can't change history. Can but we? I hardly know you. Oh, well, if you'd known each other, I wouldn't have to introduce you, would I? Maybe somebody'd better explain this to me. Ah, fine. Now we're off to a start. Hi, ball, Grandma? Yeah, I think I need one. Mm. Now a little more romantic setting. Soft lights now, and now I'll leave you two to canoodle a bit. I've other things. But Harry, Harry. I'll take care of Harry. That'll be Laura. Run high. Do something. Oh, relax, Grandpa. I'll take care of everything. But Peter Manson wasn't the only one having trouble with the little man who wasn't there. So the future cannot be handled logically. It's logically impossible because. Uh, it doesn't exist yet. And if it doesn't exist, then obviously it isn't logical. But it's going to exist, so... Well, you, you see what I mean. Logic is just hopeless. I should ought to clobber you. Oh, now be reasonable, Harry. It wouldn't prove anything. But Amelia's my girl. Get over it, Harry. They're probably arranging their engagement right now. You You're... meddler. I am not a meddler, Laura. I'm just an instrument of fate. Fate? Poor Peter thrown to that blonde lion. Oh, uh, you stop calling my girl names, you hear? You're acting like a pair of spoiled children. Now, stop it. I regret that you've lost your love, but really no one ever actually died of unrequited love. Mine wasn't unrequited. Well, it might as well be once they're happily married. Happily married? Well, you wouldn't want them unhappy, would you? No, I'd like a little happiness myself. Well, so would we all, but stop and think. Now, if a number of human lives depended upon your giving up a love affair, would you go on selfishly and marry the man anyway? Well, that's hardly fair. Well, then I'll put it up to Harry. Harry, if your own life depended upon preventing a wrong marriage, would you stand by and let them go ahead? Make your own point, you're the meddler. All right, all right. My life depends upon it. My father's life depends upon it. Unless Peter Manson and Amelia Carter marry, neither my father nor I can be born. Now, knowing this, I used my grandfather's time machine, came back to give a formal introduction. Now, you can't blame me for wanting to live, so I came back and I fixed it up. Yes, you're a great little fixer-upper. Maybe we should ought to fix you up and then go on as we please about it. You don't know much about time and history, do you? No, but I could make you up a... You could not. You could not change a thing. Why not? If your father and mother had never met, could you have been born? Oh, don't be utterly ridiculous. Now, don't ever be scornful of stating a simple fact. I exist, therefore I am. Now, say it as you please. To you, Peter and Amelia will marry. To me, Peter and Amelia married 50 years ago. Now, the sensible thing to do is to accept the fact. Wipe it off the slate. Pick up the pieces and go on from there. Such as? Well, now, you're both very attractive people. You have a common bond of memory. Hey, my time. Well, I looked at better myself. Oh, Gad, this is a primitive era. Tell folks what's best for them and they want to... What is the term, Harry? Clobber you. Yes, that's right. Clobber me. That's the best idea I've heard all night. No, not here. Outside, where I can stop being a lady. Then I'll help you. Well, you can beat me up, but you can't change something that's already happened. Now, can you? Look, I've taken all I can. I'm going home. Uh, okay, can I? Uh, oh, that is a fine, practical arrangement. Find sympathy in one another. It's the better thing to do. And maybe you'll find happiness with one another, too. <laughs> Get out of this mess? Well, if I cut my throat, I can't invent the time machine, and then he couldn't come back and mess up our lives by forcing me to marry you. Ah, oh, you'd rather commit suicide than marry me. Oh, now, Amelia, stop it. That's not so. Oh, so you'd rather marry me than commit suicide. Oh, stop the bawling and let me think. Peter, do you think he'd go away from me to talk like, like everything was running smooth? What do you mean? Well, suppose we stop squabbling and, and complaining and 
made up to one another so he'd think we were happy and, and convinced that he's right. Maybe he'd be satisfied and go back where he came from. Then we could do as we please. More work. I know. That character is our grandson, Amelia. Already he knows what we're going to do. Not even willing to try. I'll try, but it's futile. What did you have in mind? Well, I just know he's coming back tonight. We could make it look as if we'd been getting acquainted. Well, what have we been doing for the past couple of hours playing tiddly... Hey, 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 let's go, my God. You're just mucking me up a little. If you're really getting acquainted, you're not looking as if we've been sitting with folded hands. Hey, stop that! Well, if you really love me, you wouldn't mind my mussing up your hair, do then. All right. There. Now you look like we've been wrestling. Mm. Where's my bag? What for? Lipstick. You should have a few smears. Well, with you looking like a magazine cover, a lipstick is a two-way smear, right? Oh, yeah. I suppose so. You sound as though Harry was the only man you ever kissed. If we ever get around to it, Peter Manson, you'll be the only man that's ever been kissed just because his teeth said he had to be. So there, if I got it, I got it. All right. Once for history. Hmm? Let's see you now. You need uh, more of a spread. Hmm. You need a touch right there. Who's doing it? One thing uh, history didn't mention. What, did I? History didn't say this could be fun. Peter. It'd be funny, wouldn't it? What could be funny? Mm-hmm. This pig wit. And then? You and me found out after he'd gone that we really did like it. Yeah. Yeah, wouldn't it? Peter? Yes? So let him wait. Now remember to look flustered. And, and try to watch your face, too. Well, I see everything's progressing fine. All right, now, 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 go away. Oh, well, I'm not going to stay. I just wanted to see how things were getting along. I know what I'm not wanting. And then why did you come here in the first place? Well, you think you hate me for my interference, but you wait and remember. In 50 years, the pair of you will be sending me off in my time machine to do this job of fixing up. And you, Grandma... Stop we... calling me Grandma! You're still my Grandma, and you'll tell me that you and Grandpa actually wasted your first kisses trying to fool me into leaving. So now I'll trot along, but I'll be back tomorrow. And don't you keep her out too late, Grandpa. What'd you do with Harry? Oh, I fixed that up fine. Harry volunteered to escort Grandpa's former girlfriend to her home. Harry and Laura? Laura with Harry? Peter? Yes, Amelia. <laughs> to heck with his sister. Kiss me once. Hmm? Oh, for goodness sake, it's three o'clock. I know what time it is. But, but, but what I want to know is what you're doing. Uh, no, I'm trying to think. Yes, you look as if you've got it all settled. Oh, well, what can I do? You might wash that blonde hussy's magenta lipstick off your silly face. Now, Laura, Laura, I can, uh, I, I can explain. I'm listening. Convince me that you got all smeared up without enjoying it. Come on, come on, convince me. You went home with Harry to be trust, didn't you? Well, I didn't see anyone around making me another offer. But I will. Were... I know. Working like a little beaver making history come out right. Well, what am I supposed to do? Bang my head against brick walls, tilt at windmills? Confound it, am I the only one around here with sense enough to know what I'm licked? Well, you might not be so completely licked if Amelia Carter wears ugly as much sense. Well, it does make my defeat less difficult to bear. Well, make it complete, then. Have this expanded to fit her pudgy little hand. My ring. But Laura, what... Goodbye, Peter. Wait, wait, don't go. What to stay for, to be a maid of honor? If you came to quarrel with me, you yourself are doing everything to prove Junior's point. If you were here, he'd be cheering you into hating me and using my telephone for calling Harry to take you home. Look, I didn't come here to fight with you, Peter. I came here to fight for you. But you're not fighting. Junior knows all the moves. No matter what I try, everything turns out his way. Yeah, it's like your experimental smooching session. Yeah, that too. He was amused. I'm not. May have started as a deliberate frame-up, but it certainly ended up ginger peachy for his little old program. I tell you, he knows every move. He came back here just to tell Amelia and me that you had gone home with Harry. And 50 years from now, you and Amelia will daughter over to his time machine and kiss your brat of a grandson goodbye as he goes off to make the introduction. That's the program, isn't it? Well, what can we do? Peter, you say everything's fixed and solid. It can't be changed. Well, that's the way it is. But let's just suppose that you could quietly unfix Junior's little apple cart. 
Well, then we go on as if he never arrived. But couldn't you? I can't prevent what's already happened. He exists. He is. He's here in the flesh. No. I suppose you can't change that, can you? No. Well, then, goodbye, Peter. Well, wait a minute, Laura. What if Junior were a different kind of guy? What do you mean? Look, Laura, he's the grandson of Amelia and me, right? Mm Mm-hmm. If I don't marry Amelia, he doesn't get born. He can't exist unless we follow every move right down to the last letter of the historic record he talks about, right? Yes, but... Let's assume that the future is not a firm and solid hunk of recorded history. Well, everyone but you and Junior have been saying that all along, but you keep pointing at Junior's history book and saying no. But suppose that Junior's history book is only one of many possible histories. Then how do you explain his solid existence? Floating a brick on water is not impossible. It's just extremely unlikely. Oh, stop sounding like a mathematics professor, Peter. Go, get to this important point. Until Junior arrived with his books and his papers to show me, uh, us, how we were going to act, he was rather unlikely as a future probability. Mm-hmm. But once he convinces us and introduces me to Amelia, Junior's existence becomes a very strong probability. In other words, he exists because he did the fixing that put history on the road that leads directly to him. Well... You could rob a bank and get tossed in jail, and that would stop you from marrying anybody. Well, we can't change things that drastically. But we might slip a little change in Junior's character. How can we do that? Suppose we could create another very strong future probability. Mightn't he come back and fight just as strong for his own existence? But how can you do anything like that? Laura, would you marry me right here and now? Peter, at three o'clock in the morning? Peter, it's Junior again. Don't go, don't go. Oh, no, no, no. Well, good morning. I'm in time, I see. You come in, I was hoping you would arrive. I am the Reverend Peter Laurel Manson III. You'll notice that my middle name is the masculine form of the given name of my grandmother, Laura. Peter, here is the other probability. Precisely. Let's get along with it quickly before something else oh, happens. Please, we must not be impatient. There must be witnesses. But I have prepared for everything. Everything. And you permit me. Do come in. Oh, this is a most auspicious occasion. Amelia! And Harry, what are they doing well, here? People here appear to have forgotten that a man has four grandparents. Well, I'm still a bit confused. Oh, my dear, if I had not been prepared for this rare and happy occasion, I should be quite disturbed. It isn't often that a man has the opportunity of officiating at a double wedding ceremony uniting his grandparents. Can you make this stick? Yes, yes. Now, unless I double-cross this double ceremony, <clears throat> now, Peter, take Laura's hand and stand away over here on my left. <laughs> now we all sort it out properly. Fine. History says that Peter and Laura will have a stalwart son. Harry and Amelia will have a fine daughter. Son and daughter are my own parents. Are you sure? I arrived a bit late, my dear, because I have been quite a busy man. I made a stopover on my trip through time, pausing long enough to unite in marriage your son with their daughter. It was a lovely wedding. <laughs> That doesn't mean you've got to be stuck with any particular mate. There's freedom of choice there. See, the only way you can get rid of the little man who isn't there is to have a different little man that's not there. That takes care of it. Superman, strange visitor from another world who came to Earth with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men. Superman, who can change the course of mighty rivers, bend steel in his bare hands, and who, disguised as Clark Kent, mild-mannered reporter for a great metropolitan newspaper, fights a never-ending battle for truth, justice, and the American way. But before we join Superman, here is an important message. 
Fellas and girls, every day the city, state, and national offices of civilian defense organizations are swamped with letters from young people like yourselves. And most of these letters ask, what can I do, what part can I take in the national war effort? The writers of these letters are all too young to join the United States Armed Forces, too young to join any of the numerous home defense groups. And yet they ask, isn't there something we can do? Some of you listening now are no doubt among those who have written those letters. And I'll bet many of you who have not written have thought the same thing. Well, the answer is a very simple one, and here it is. You can do your part in civilian defense. You can help win this war by buying war saving stamps regularly. How does that help you, ask? How can my dime or 20 or 40 or 50 cents help win this war? That's easy. For instance, your dime, just 10 cents, will buy five 45 caliber bullets that can be used by our soldiers, sailors, or Marines to knock five Japs or five Nazis out of commission. And believe me, it's going to take a lot of those bullets to knock them all out and win this war. Another thing, 50 cents, which represents five 10 cents, or two 25 cent war saving stamps, will buy enough fuel oil to bring one of our destroyers a full mile closer to the Jap fleet in the Solomon Islands. And you know what happens when our Navy gets close enough to turn on the heat. And here's one more thing for you to think over. If every fella and girl in the United States bought at least five ten-cent war-saving stamps every day, the amount of money they would lend to the government would buy enough fighter planes and bombers to blast Hitler's Luftwaffe right out of the air. So remember that each and every dime is important. That buying war-saving stamps is a very important way to help win this war. So why not pledge today to buy war-saving stamps regularly? And keep in mind this slogan. Every time you've got a dime, buy a war-saving stamp. And now, the adventures of Superman. Superman is now trying to solve the mystery of the tiny men. The tiny men have on several occasions appeared in London where Kent and Lois Lane, girl reporter, are now working as foreign correspondents. No taller than an ordinary milk bottle or a 12-inch ruler, the tiny men are nevertheless deadly, for they've already caused the death of the daughter of Professor Giraud a scientist who possesses a secret formula desperately wanted by the Nazis. In our last episode, we heard how Jimmy and Lois, while visiting the Tower of London, were trapped by a Nazi agent in a condemned dungeon of the Bloody Tower. Superman, in the guise of Clark Kent, investigated the Tower that night but failed to find his friend. At the suggestion of the Chief Warder, he telephoned their hotel, thinking they might have returned. Professor Giraud answered the phone. In the midst of their conversation, the professor suddenly screamed in fear. The tiny men, he cried. They're here. They're after me. The phone went dead. Leaving the tower quickly, Superman stripped off the disguise of Clark Kent and went into action. We join him now as he streaks down out of the night sky and lands in front of the boarding house on Bayswater Road. There. there. That didn't take me long. Fortunately, the street's deserted at this hour. I'd better get inside and see what's happened to Professor Giraud. No time to change identities. Ah, there's the flat. Door wide open. Mm. Professor Giraud lying on the floor. Great Scott. Mm. Professor. Professor Giraud. Is that you, Monsieur Kent? Is there... No. Who are you? Never mind that now. I'm here to help you. Tell me quickly what happened. I... I had the telephone ringing. Yes. I came in here to answer it. I know. It was a friend of mine, Clark Kent. He wanted to know... Yes, yes, but what happened here? Uh, while I, I talked to him, I had movement behind me. I turned... Yes, yes, go on. Uh, Try to go on, please. Tiny men. Three, four of them what? standing in the doorway. The sight of them so queer, so strange. I fainted. They have always filled me with horror. And I am an old man. What then? Uh, what happened after that? When I came to my senses, there were two men in the room. They called each other Muller and Dr. Wright. Oh? I have heard of Dr. Wright before. Cruel, vicious, shrewd. I... I talk too much. I have not much time. I must tell you. I must tell you. Yes, go on. They... They forced me, forced me to tell where I eat the formula. What? They are on their way now to get it. They must not. They must not. With that formula in their possession, the world, the entire world is doomed. Where is it? The formula, where is it? Tell me quickly. 
I, I did it. I, I am so tired. Tell me, where is the formula? Tired. Sleep. Sleep. Oh. Well, he'll never tell me now. Funny, though, his talking about sleep at a time like this. A dying man in these circumstances doesn't talk about sleep. Is he trying to tell me something? And if he was, what? Sleep. Doesn't make sense. Wait a minute and let... Yes, by heaven, it does. Sleep, of course. It couldn't mean anything else but that. Oh, if only I'm in time. If only... Out the window. Now then, up, up, and away! Faster than a speeding bullet, Superman wings his way across a silent, blacked-out London. Even as he does so, the warning wail of an air raid alert breaks the silence. And shortly after, the dull thudding of the ak ak guns announced the arrival of enemy planes. And while the Luftwaffe tries to break through the defenses of London, as the RAF wings into the sky to do battle, a quiet scene is taking place outside the fairy tale exhibit at Madame Tussauds Waxworks. Here, yeah, come up. Here's the entrance to the fairy tale exhibit. We shall soon have what we want, and then we'll, uh, then we shall really be masters of the world, eh? Well, is this formula, is it really so important? What exactly the formula is, I do not know. As to its importance, well, would I have been called to Dr. Scotton to confer with our beloved Führer if it were not important? The Führer himself told me that on that formula depended the possible winning or losing of the war. You, you think we shall be rewarded handsomely? Eh? <laughs> we shall indeed. Now then, see if you can find a light switch. There should be one right here by the door. I saw it here. Uh, look, the exhibit themselves light up. Yeah. I see they have replaced the exhibit of the Black Knight following that stupid failure of our henchmen. There is the Gulliver exhibit. And over there is the one we are looking for. Sleeping Beauty. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hey, Doctor, what is that figure standing over there? Hmm? Oh, the one in the red tape and the blue suit. Yes, with the letter S on his chest. Oh, probably some legendary hero of the English. I have never seen anything like him before. But come, the formula. Professor Giro said he had placed it between the hands of the sleeping beauty. Between the hands, yes. And there are her hands clasped across her breast. Will they break if we separate them? What does it matter? Look, Muller, my own hands are trembling. I, who pride myself on my calm nerve, I tremble at the thought that in another moment... The formula will be in our possession. Yes. I, too, am, am, am not myself. <laughs> There's a feeling of, of tension in the air. Feeling this yes. quiet. I am now about to separate the hands of this wax figure. Now. <gasps> hey, doctor, we have been tricked. The formula's not here. But Professor Giraud said... He lied. He tricked us. He did not lie, Dr. Weiss. What? Who said that? I did, Dr. Weiss. But you leave her. Doctor, look. The wax figure... The man in the red cape is coming toward us. All right, Miller. Wrong again. I'm no wax figure. I'm flesh and blood, as you two gentlemen will find out in a moment or two. I have a gun, whoever you are. And you know how to shoot it. You people always use the same line. Huh? Well, if we must go through this dreary business again, let's get over it quickly. Point your gun at me and shoot. You have the formula. Hand it over. I have the formula, but I'm not handing it over. Finders keepers, you know. Then I'm afraid I must kill you, Come my friend. here, ah. don't fight. <laughs> Not these folks that are Let's Superman. Let's Let see what we can do against the real Superman. My throat! Take your hands off my throat! My life! I'm getting out of my throat! Oh, no, you're not! He's lying! He's lying for there! Well, the greatest of ease. Sorry to do this, Muller. I'm afraid it'll hurt you more than it will me. Not so fast, fight. What have you or your men done with Miss Lane and Jimmy Olsen? I know nothing whatever about... Oh. That was just a love tap, Doctor. I want you to remain conscious until you tell me where they are. I tell you, I know nothing whatever. Come on now, before I lose my temper. I... I know nothing about them. I, I swear it. You hear? I, I swear it. Mike, let's get one thing straight. No. Something happened to Jimmy and Miss Lane in the Tower of London today. I'm as sure of that as I've ever been of anything. You can save us both a great deal of trouble by telling me where they are. I haven't really started working on your fight, no. and I don't want to. No. But I will if you force me to. Now then, are you going to talk or aren't you? Even as Superman tries to force Dr. Vibe to reveal the whereabouts of Lois Lane and Jimmy, the girl reporter and the Daily Planet's copy boy lie imprisoned in the dark cellar of the Bloody Tower. Far in the distance, they can hear the dull reverberations of German bombs falling on London. Jim, did you hear that? Yeah, kind of close. Jimmy, I don't like this. 
You remember what that so-called guard said about the cellar being closed off to visitors because it was unsafe? Yeah. Well, the bombings London has been subjected to must have done a great deal to weaken the supporting arches and beams down here. That rumbling we heard. I think it was one of the arches beginning to give way. Sleeping, Merkel. In that case, I wouldn't be surprised if this room collapsed on us. Nor I. Well, be a quicker death than starvation. Oh, yeah. gosh, don't talk about it. My stomach feels as empty as the inside of a bass drum. Miss Lane, do you think Mr. Kent will find us, maybe, huh? Well, he'll investigate, of course. He knows we came to the tower this afternoon. But I don't think they'll ever think of looking down here. No, Jimmy, I guess you and I might just as well. Jim, hey. Something hit me on the head. I heard like old Harry, too. Wait a minute, my hand just touched it. What is it? It's a piece of rock. Gee, that means the ceiling above well, us. Maybe not, Miss Lane. Maybe. Oh, not. why fool ourselves, Jim? This room is over five hundred years old. They built them strong in those days, but not that strong. And that ceiling up there is beginning to give way at last. If another bomb or two falls anywhere near the Tower of London, our goose will be done to a turn. Uh oh! Speak of the devil. Sounds like one of those German planes just dropped a stack of bombs right on the tower itself. Listen to him. Still exploding. Jimmy, listen. That must oh. oh, 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 be on the head. Me too. Leaping they're falling all around. Jimmy, we've got to get out of here. If we oh, don't, we can't. Listen, that ceiling's giving way. It'll collapse any minute now. What can we do, Jimmy? What can we do? There's nothing Jimmy or Lois can do. But there's plenty Superman could do if only he arrives in time. Everything depends on how long it takes him to force the confession from Dr. Byte. In our next episode, we'll know what happened. We'll also hear the solution to the strange mystery of the tiny men. Have you figured out the answer to the tiny men yet? Who are these strange little creatures no bigger than a milk bottle? Well, if you want the answer, be sure to listen in Monday, same time, same station. Tune in and follow the adventures of Superman. Well, there goes Superman until Monday of next week. Meanwhile, don't let the weekend go by without buying your share of war saving stamps. And remember what I told you at the beginning of this program, you fellows and girls who are too young to join the armed forces or any of the national defense organizations. You can do your part. You can help win this war by buying war saving stamps regularly. So talk it over tonight with mother and dad. Ask them to give you a dime every day or even every other day for war-saving stamps. And then buy some extra stamps out of your regular weekly allowance. Get all your friends to buy stamps regularly, too. Or better yet, why not organize a war-saving stamp club right on your block or in your neighborhood? Make this your club slogan. Every time you've got a dime, buy a war-saving stamp. Faster than a speeding bullet! More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look! Look in the sky! It's a bird! It's a plane! It's Superman! Follow the adventures of Superman every day, Monday through Friday, same time, same station. Superman is written and directed by George Lothar and is a copyrighted feature appearing in Action Comics magazine. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Yes, it's Superman, strange visitor from another world who came to Earth with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men. Superman, who can change the course of mighty rivers, bend steel in his bare hands, and who, disguised as Clark Kent, mild-mannered reporter for a great metropolitan newspaper, fights a never-ending battle for truth, justice, and the American way. But before we join Superman, here is an important message. Fellas and girls, have you ever seen a squadron of American bombers roaring through the air in formation? Have you seen newsreel pictures of Uncle Sam's destroyers 
cutting through the seas on patrol in search of enemy subs and surface raiders. I'm sure you have, and I bet you were thrilled. You probably felt terribly proud, too. Well, if you've been buying war savings stamps regularly, you have a right to be proud. Not only because those planes and those ships represent the fighting spirit of America, but because you helped to build them. Yes, sir, every time you bought a war savings stamp, your money helped by the labor and materials that are used to make planes and ships and equipment to knock out the Nazis and the Japs. So next time you hear some boy or girl on your block say, Oh, shut, what difference does it make if I buy one stamp or not? What difference can one dime make? You tell them it does make a difference. It makes a big difference. Tell them, for instance, that five dimes will buy enough fuel oil to take an American destroyer one full mile closer to its objective. Or that one dime will buy five forty-five caliber bullets. Tell them that if every boy and girl in the United States bought just one ten-cent war-saving stamp every day, it would add up to enough money to buy a lot of swift pursuit planes with which our Army and Navy forces could blast the axis out of the air. And while you're at it, you might remind them that this is one way that all you fellows and girls can help win this war. Now, after all, everybody can't join Uncle Sam's armed forces, but all of us can buy war-saving stamps. So talk it over with Mother and Dad tonight. Tell them you want to help Uncle Sam win this war by buying war-saving stamps regularly. Buy them every day, if possible. And I'm sure that they're going to be glad to cooperate. And now, the adventures of Superman. Superman, in his disguise of Clark Kent, Lois Lane, girl reporter, and Jimmy Olsen, Clark's young friend, are now in colorful, romantic Arabia. Strange things have already begun to happen. Yesterday, Lois wanted to have her future read by a fortune teller in the bazaars of Mecca. And she was a little upset when the fortune teller, a look of terror on his face, refused to tell her fortune. Shortly afterward, as they continued to push their way through the noisy, crowded bazaars, Jimmy and Kent suddenly realized that Lois was not with them, that she had mysteriously vanished. Has something happened to Lois? We'll know in a moment. Listen. I don't see Lois at all, Jimmy. She couldn't have fallen that far behind. We've got to find her, and right away. Sally, you don't suppose she's been... I mean, a fortune teller and everything? You don't think... There's no time for thinking, Jim. We've got to act. Well, what do we do? First, we've got to be sure that Lois hasn't stopped off in one of the shops to buy something. Oh, she wouldn't have done that without well, we, telling us. We've got to make sure. Come on. Wait. Just a can't look. What? That man with the red hat on his head. The Fez. Yes, he's the same one you bumped into several times by accident. It was no accident. Mr. the can't... There's something queer about that bird. Look, look at that, that sort of half smile on his face. Yes, there is something about the way he's looking at us that... Come on, Jim. We're going to have a talk with that Arab. Okay. Is he an Arab? Well, he's certainly dressed like one. Look, he's trying to move away through the crowd. He doesn't want to talk to us. Oh, it's coming. I noticed that, too. Well, we just have to catch up with him. Are you there? Wait a minute. Just a minute there. Oh, he's stopping. Look, he's turning around. Gosh, he's so tall and thin and strange looking. You there! I am oh. honored, Effendi. Do you wish to talk to me? Uh, you've been pretty close to us ever since we came into this street. My young friend here bumped into you several times. The streets are narrow, Effendi. I regret any inconvenience. No, it isn't that I want to talk about. A young lady with us. Did you notice her by any chance? Notice her? Yes. Uh, vaguely, yes. I was aware there was a female with you. And why do you ask? Is something amiss? Uh, no. No, thanks, thanks. Sorry to have troubled you. Shrakanani, Effendi. Shrakanani. Oh, he sure left in a hurry. Slid into the crowd like, like a snake. Didn't get much out of him, I'm afraid. I can't understand it, Jim. Something's happened to Lois. I'm convinced of it now. Well, I am, too. Well, what can we do about it? I don't know. Let me think. Jim, that fortune teller, you remember the one who refused to tell Lois his fortune because he said something terrible was going to happen to her? Yeah, but you said he was a fake, that it was just a trick. Oh, all fortune tellers are fakes, Jim. Which leads me to believe this one was in on whatever game is being played here. You mean you, you think he might know what's happened to Miss Lane? I wouldn't be at all surprised. Come on. We're going to find that fortune teller and make him open up. Maybe he won't talk. Maybe he'll... he'll talk if we have to choke every word out of him. Come on, Jim. There he is. Fortunes, fortunes, tell your fortune. I want to see you, mister. Fendi, you wish your fortune. Uh, no, leave me in peace. But, Karani, you are the one with the female. Leave me in peace. I'll leave you in peace, friend, after you tell me what I want to know. 
What has happened to that young woman? No, 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 I will not tell. It is true. Never mind true. the build-up. She's disappeared, vanished. Now I want to know what's happened to she her. She had vanished already so soon. Mm. What do you mean? Her fate was written in the sand. I dared not tell her, but I thought not it would come so soon. Oh, stop the mumbo-jumbo. I'm convinced you know what's happened to her. This is all part of some trick. Trick? Trick? You, you think I fool you? Well, certainly. You don't expect me to believe that you actually saw anything written in that silly sand of yours. Of course, of course. I might have known. You are not an Oriental. You come not from the East. You could not possibly believe that I have power to tell the future. Of course we don't believe it. It's a fake, isn't it, Mr. Kent? Naturally. So be it. Fortune, fortune, Effendi. Oh, he's fortune. ignoring us, Mr. Kent. What are we going to do? Well, physical violence won't do any good with his kind, I'm afraid, Jim. Maybe we'd better try playing the game. What do you mean? And you'll see. Uh, look, friend. Yes? Uh, I, uh, I've got to find that young woman. She's vanished. Disappeared completely. Can you... Can you help me? Perhaps it is possible, and perhaps the sands will tell what you should do. Shall I read the sands, Effendi? Oh, yes, yes, please do. Very well. I, I stare the sands. I stare the sands so. And now I gaze upon what there is written. What do you see? Wait, wait, Fendi, wait. Gosh, Mr. Ken, look. His eyes are positively blazing. Gee, maybe there is something in this fortune-telling business. Nonsense, huh? Jim, nonsense. Uh, Fendi? Yes? Here's what you must do if you would find the female. Yes, go on. When the muezzin calls from the minaret, follow on where the music shall lead. Huh? I don't understand. I can tell you no more. When the muezzin calls from the minaret... Follow on where the music shall lead. That hardly tells us a thing when the muezzin calls from the minute. Hello. What is going on back there? There seems to be trouble of some sort, Mr. Kent. There's a whole crowd of arrows milling around someone or something. Help! 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 Did you hear that, Mr. Kent? I certainly did. Someone needs help. Oh, come on, then. Let's help them before that crowd kills them. Not on your life. They tear us to bits. You wait here. Where are you going, Mr. Kent? You get the police. I'll be back in a jiffy. Huh. Here's a dark doorway. No one can see me here. I couldn't possibly handle that mob as Clark Kent, but I certainly can as Superman. Now to step out into the street and join the fun. Up, up and at him. There. All right, out of the way. Out of the way. Let me get to that man. Oh, you would, would you? Oh, neatly done. Jolly good old boy. Jolly old boy. Jimmy, get back there. Get out of the way. Not on your life. I'm going to help you if I can. There, you take that. <laughs> nice work, youngster. I wish I could handle them the way you do. Get throwing them around by the dozens. Oh, they're scattering fast. Oh, looks like you've done the trick. Yes, it does. Take care of our English friend over there. I've got to leave now. Oh, but Superman, wait a minute. Up, up and away. Oh, golly. What a man. Uh, you there, boy. Uh, help me up here. Will you help me up? Uh, Gosh, you're in a bad way, sir. Oh, yeah. Those Arabs would have killed you if it hadn't been for Superman. Uh, well, I joy will think they did anyhow. My skull's cracked beyond repair. The back springs so I can hardly stand, and I'm not sure... Oh, no. No! What is it, sir? Me monocle. Your what? Me monocle. Me eyeglass. Oh, look at it. Look at it lying in the dust, shattered beyond recall. Oh, gosh. I thought it was something oh, pretty God. bad the way you talk. It's only a monocle. Only a monocle? Only a monocle. Hear me, my dear misguided you. That monocle has been twice around the world. No ordinary monocle match. Played to the crowned heads of Europe. To the President of the United States. The Premier of France. Hey, what's going on here? Or rather, what stops here? What happened to the riot? Oh, Superman took a hand in it. What? It didn't last long after that. Superman? Yeah, I wonder where he came from. All I know is he always manages to turn up when he's most needed. Oh, dear. Perhaps if I were to pit the pieces together with some sort of sick me bob What's the matter with him, Jim? Oh, oh he had it. The Arabs yeah, almost killed him before oh. Superman arrived. Oh. And all he cares about now is that oh. broken monocle. Huh. Uh, excuse me, oh, my, my name is Clark Kent, and this is my friend Jimmy Olsen. We tried to come to your rescue. Yes, 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 devilishly sporting of you. Too bad you couldn't play my monocle, you know. Oh, uh, excuse me, frightfully neglectful of me, I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Sir Mycroft Bittersweet. Oh. That's my stage name, you know. I've forgotten my real one. Oh, you're an actor. An actor? I am an interpreter, sir. An interpreter of the bard. Shakespeare, you know. Uh, William. Three times around the world, sir. Three times? I thought you said the monocle had been around the world twice. Uh, well, yes, I left it at home once. <laughs> oh, so yes. you're a Shakespearean actor. Oh, quite. Uh, how did you start this riot? What made those Arabs so mad? Oh, oh, oh that, yes, yes. Frightfully sordid business. 
Dates, sir. Dates? Yes, I ate some dates from that stand over there. And the ruddy proprietor of the establishment demanded payment. Quite right, of course. Yes. I said I'd pay him by reciting a speech from the immortal works of Shakespeare. And I did so. What then? He hit me on the head what? with a slightly used pomegranate. <laughs> An awkward nose. Yes. I, I take it you haven't any money. Money? Money? Of what use is money, sir, to an interpreter of... What's that? Oh, the Muezzin, Mohammedan Clar of the Hour of Prayer. If you ask me, could you use a few lessons in voice culture? Please, quiet. Uh... Gosh, look. All the Arabs are kneeling, facing the east. Yes. When the Muezzin calls from the minaret, follow on where the music leads. Well, if there was anything in what that fortune teller said, we ought to hear some music or something, oughtn't we? Yes. Quiet, listen. Hear anything? No, and of course we wouldn't. It, it was nothing but just... Wait. Listen. I say, devilishly odd music, that. Where's it coming from? What interests me is where it's going to lead us to. Come on, let's follow it. But how... How can we follow music? Well, I don't know, Jim, but we'll try. Come on. I say, old man, may I come to... Huh? If you want to. Uh, right. Uh, never know, I might be of some help. World travelers such as myself picks up a good deal of useful knowledge four times around the world. Well, our friends are having some weird and interesting adventures and meeting some odd characters in the bargain. What strange mystery is beginning to weave itself around Kent and Jimmy in Arabia? What has happened to Lois? Will the music lead them to her? Be sure to hear tomorrow's exciting episode. Listen every day, Monday through Friday, same time, same station. Tune in and follow the adventures of Superman. By all means, don't forget to tune in to Superman tomorrow for another thrilling and exciting episode. And don't forget to talk to Mother and Dad before you go to bed tonight about making arrangements to buy war-saving stamps regularly. Start the day off right tomorrow. Buy at least one 10-cent war-saving stamp first thing after breakfast. And remember what I told you at the beginning of this program. Every single dime is important because all our dimes put together can go a long way to help pay for the guns and the tanks and the planes and the ships that we need to knock out the Nazis and Jets. And say, here's an idea. Why don't you get together with your friends tomorrow and make a joint pledge to buy war-saving stamps every time you've got a dime? See which of you can buy the most war-saving stamps every week and every month. In that way, you'll be doing your share to win this war. Faster than a speeding bullet! More powerful than a locomotive! Able to leap tall buildings in a single bound! Follow the adventures of Superman every day, Monday through Friday, same time, same station. Superman is written and directed by George Lothar and is a copyrighted feature appearing in Action Comics magazine. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. you to Rockin' Into the Future with Tom Corbett, Space Cadet. Stand by to raise ship, blast off, minus five, four, three, two, one, zero! As roaring rockets blast off to distant planets and far-flung stars... We take you to the age of the conquest of space with Tom Corbett, Space Cadet. Midway in the 
asteroid belt, a vast scattering of cosmic fragments between the planets Mars and Jupiter, lies Prison Rock, a barren asteroid of solid rock and dead soil. Here, beneath the great plastic bubble which holds an artificially created atmosphere, live the lifers, the most dangerous criminals in the universe. Entering the Stone Administration building, a prisoner trustee approaches the barred door of the warden's office. A stooped, gray-haired man with faded blue eyes and a kindly face, he peers through the bars and speaks. It's me, Warden, Hogue. Oh, just a minute, Hogue. Okay, come in. Thank you, sir. Happy birthday, Warden. Why, thank you, Hogue. How did you know it was my birthday? Oh, I've been here a long time, sir. Twenty years. You get to know things in that time. Uh, I've brought you these. Roses. Hogue, you're a genius to make roses grow on this asteroid. Patience and hard work, sir. Sorry there's only three of them. Why, they're beautiful. You know, I can't help wondering sometimes, a man with your intelligence and love of beauty... How I could be a habitual criminal, sir? Yes. I can understand it with a man like Bull Carson, for instance. He's a brute, a killer. But you... I made mistakes, sir. But believe me, I'll never make enough. Unfortunately, you won't get another chance. Men who come to the rock aren't eligible for parole. And in your case, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, I, I mean it. You've been a model prisoner. An excellent trustee. But there's nothing I can do. Well, thank you again, Hope. I won't forget your thoughtfulness. You certainly won't, no. Warden. Don't move. Hope, where did you get that heat ray? Put it down. Don't move or I'll kill you. Sit down. No. Uh -huh. Not by your desk. In that chair there. You must be crazy. No, Warden. I've waited 20 years for this. Planned every move while I rotted here. I'm leaving this rock. You are crazy. There's no possible escape from this asteroid. You know that. Oh, there's a way, Warden. Hope, do you realize there's a patrol rocket on guard outside our atmosphere cell every minute? They'll blast any ship that tries to get through to help you. No ship's going to get through. It's the patrol rocket we ain't to use. What are you talking about? Hulk, put down that ray gun. The guard will be here any second. No, they won't. No, don't. I... <laughs> okay, Bull. Got him, eh, Hulk? Naturally. He's trusted me for years. Wait, I'll open the door for you. Good boy. Is he dead? I don't think so. How about the guards? We took care of everyone, the crumbs. It was easy the way you set it up. Except for the six guys with us, the other cons don't know what's going on yet. Good. If they knew, we'd have trouble. They'd all want to go along, and there's only room for the eight of us who've had experience as rocketeers. Okay, sure, you can work it. We get the patrol to land here without them suspecting nothing. Leave it to me. I know the code signal, everything. Tie up the warden. I'm going to the communications room. <laughs> Controller guy, what do you have? Roger Manning craves some excitement, Junior. The board silly. We're on patrol over Prison Rock, Space Boy, which means we just go round and round and... And round and round. I wish Astro was with us. At least I could insult him. <laughs> Don't blow your jets. Just two days more and we can go back to the Academy. It'll seem like heaven. Hey, wait, Tom. There's a message coming in. Call Captain Andrews. Now, here's the captain now. Message coming in, sir. Very well, Father. Patch it down, Manning. Here it comes, sir. Calling patrol rocket code 16. Come in, please. That's the prison rock code signal. Patrol rocket Polaris to prison rock. Go ahead. Emergency here, sir. The warden is very ill, and the medical officer says he must be taken to Mars Port at once. Our operating facilities aren't adequate. Can the warden speak to me? Uh, no, sir. It's very urgent. The medical officer says every minute counts. Very well. We'll come down at once. Have the warden ready for immediate travel. End transmission. All right, cadets. Prepare to put down on prison rock. Well, Hulk, what happened? The rocket's coming into land, Paul. Great. How many men on the patrol? Usually just an officer and two men. Three of them. Uh, let's get the reception committee together. This'll be a cinch. We'll return.
return to the exciting adventures of Tom Corbett, Space Cadet, in just a moment. So stand by. Attention all spacemen. Take advantage of this special offer. The greatest offer ever made by Kellogg's Pep. It's your opportunity to get official Space Cadet goggles. That's right. Official Space Cadet goggles. The same kind of goggles worn by Tom Corbett out in the farthest reaches of space. Listen to this official description of space goggles issued by Space Academy Supply Headquarters. They're made out of one sweeping curved plastic plate, like one giant bubble that fits right over both eyes. Space goggles provide for a full range of vision and can even be worn over eyeglasses. Space goggles are issued in regulation colors. Now, spacemen, you want to wear your goggles anytime you're racing into the wind. On skates, on a bike, in a car. Get your space goggles now. Here's what to do. Get a box of delicious Kellogg's Pep, the build-up wheat cereal. Then, you'll not only start the day with a spaceman's breakfast, swell-tasting Kellogg's Pep, but you'll also have a box top to help you get your goggles. Now, here's how. Send 25 cents. One Kellogg's Pep box top, your name and address. Repeat, 25 cents. One Kellogg's Pep box top, your name and address. Send to this address. Kellogg's, Box 346, Battle Creek, Michigan. Kellogg's, Box 346, Battle Creek, Michigan. Don't delay. Get your space goggles today. Full of dangerous convicts have seized control of Prison Rock and have decoyed the patrol rocket Polaris manned by Captain Jeffers, Tom Corbett, and Roger Manning to the asteroid. Now on Prison Rock, Captain Jeffers has gone to the warden's quarters, leaving Tom and Roger with the Polaris. An unnatural silence seems to brood over the grim space island of solid stone cell blocks. It's taking Captain Jeffers a long time to get back, Roger. Well, the warden's sick, Tom. they got to get him ready for the trip to Mars. He was supposed to be ready when we landed. Say, doesn't it seem awfully quiet to you? Ah, the guys in those cell blocks are here for life. What do you expect them to do, sing for joy? They made a fair amount of racket last time I was here. Seems to me there were more guards in the compound that time, too. Well, what do they need guards for? There's no place for the convicts to go, even if they broke out of their cells. I suppose you're right. But... Wait, Tom. Here comes somebody. Oh, it's that trustee again. The one who met us when we landed. <laughs> Hard to believe he's a dangerous criminal. He is, though, if he's here. I know, but he looks like such a sweet old grandpa. Go ahead, Roger. If you two gentlemen, please, uh, Captain Jeffers wants you to join him at the warden's quarters. Both of us? Uh, yes, sir. At once, he said. Come on, Tom. Oh, wait, Roger. It's against regulations to leave the rocket unguarded. It'll be quite safe, sir. Maybe, but just the same. Oh, wait, Joan. Your orders are orders, especially from Captain Jeffers. Well, okay. Be right back. Hey, what now? I got something on board the Polaris. Be with you in a second. It'll be your fault if Jeffers fuses our jets. Say, the air is pretty good here. Better in most places with an atmosphere shell, Mr. Uh... Myron Hogue is the name, sir. Yes, our air plant is quite efficient. Uh, that's it over there, beyond the main cell block. Uh-huh. Gosh, it's quiet here. Well, sir, when men are resigned to their fate... Oh, Oh, sure. Hey, Tom, what's keeping you? Coming, Roger. Oh, hurry up. Want to get us into real trouble? Trouble? Oh, that's something we never have here. This way, gentlemen. In here, please. What the... Tom, look, in the chair. It's the warden, tied and gagged. What's going on here? Out boats, sonny boys. Nice work, Hulk. A big guy with a ray. Say, who are you and where's Captain Jack? Cut us. We got them all now, Hulk. That's it, Ball. <laughs> well, this works out just dandy. Tom, the trustee's got a ray gun, too. Guess we walked into a prison break, Roger. Yeah, prize space suckers. We and the captain both. I said shut up. We'll take these two below with the others, Hulk. Finish them and blast off in their rocket. Finish us? Keep your blaster on them. I'll take the warden. Wait, Ball, listen. Ah, it's just a guy sounding off. Come on. No, wait. It sounds like... Well, here's Willie. What is it, Willie? The crime's in the blocks. They found out what we're up to. And, uh, and they're caught. Say we ain't blasting off the rock without them. 
I was afraid of that. Get ready, Roger. I'll try not to get it. Fool, if they all fight to get in the rocket, we're sunk. Yeah, where are our guys, Willie, with the guns? In the compound, trying to hold the others back, but we need help. Come on, Hope, we'll take care of them. Willie, you watch these space boys. If they try anything, burn them. Okay, huh? we'd better hurry. Come on. Just this one guy here now, Tom. What's about body, you and I'll singe them fancy britches? I guess that's right. We've got to do something, Roger. Hey, hey, what's that? Come him, Roger, now. Hey. When you, Tom? Now, Willie boy, take this. Hey. Get his gun hand, Roger. I got it. Good. They should hold Willie. That does it, Tom. Now to find Captain Jeffers and stop those convicts. Wait, first untie the warden. Oh, yeah. We'll have you free in a moment, sir. Get his gag off, Roger. Right. There we are, warden. Uh, good work, boys. Come on now, hurry. Let's get on the audio channel and communicate with the solar guard. Wait, sir. Captain Jeffers is... Can't spare a second. The most dangerous criminals in the universe are loose. Follow me. <laughs> Here's the communications room. We'll contact the solar guard. Have them here in short order. Wait, Gordon. Roger, look. Great guns. The transmitters, everything. Rick. We're sending no message. The convicts have been sure of that. Well, what do we do? Hogan Bull will blast off and the others will finish us. They won't blast off just yet, Roger. Of course they will, Corbett. That was their scheme, to use the Polaris as a getaway rocket. I know, sir, but I removed the control head and hit it in a jet tube. It'll take them a while to find it. Hey, Junior, that was smart. It'll only delay the inevitable, I'm afraid. Sooner or later, they'll... Op- Wait. Wait, I think they're coming back. We can see from this window. It's both Carson and his crowd. I guess they've driven the other convicts back into the cell. And brother, they look mad. Do you think they discovered the control head is missing, Junior? If they have, we need guns. Warden, where can we find... No, no, call No good covered at all. First thing Hogan Bull did was to raid the arsenal. Uh-oh. That's dandy. Then we just wait here for those killers like sitting ducks. This door will keep them out for a while. Too high up for them to scale a wall. Well, it makes me feel a little better, Warden. Snap out of it, Roger. This only gives us a breathing spell. Come on, go on, get to work. Sure, it's sprout wings and fly out the window. No, smart boy, but I've been looking over this super frequency setup. I think maybe we can patch it up enough to get a message out. Oh, but that'd be great. If it works. Come on, let's get to work and find out. Here they come. Let's get at the equipment. Open up, Warden. We know you're in there with those space boys. Take my advice, Carson. And go back to your cell. Hey, you kidding? Open up, I say. Hand me the power coil, Roger. Here you are. You can't get off the asteroid, and the solar guard will be here soon. Give up and save your lives. Listen, wise guy. We want the rocket control head. Tell us where it is, and we'll leave you be. Don't tell us. We'll blast the door open, and heaven help you then. Uh-oh, here it comes, Tom. A ray blast. Well, keep working, Roger. Don't stop. We get the control head, Warden. No! And if you listen to me... Warden, get away from the door. Those killers. If you boys can just fix that transmitter before they break in. We're trying, sir. We're trying. It's no use, Paul. These low-power rays can't knock over that door. All right, what's keeping Willie? I sent him to the arsenal for the big stuff, the horse rejector. He'll be along. Ah, here he comes. Willie! Too quiet out there. I don't like it, boys. Now, just be good about ten minutes longer. We'll have this transmitter ready to go. Hand me that frequency tuner, Raj. Here you are. Won't be long now, Warden. We'll have the solar guard right ready. Out... Craters are lunar. Get back, Roger. They've brought up the heavy-duty force projector. I was afraid of that. By Jupiter, Tom, now we are sunk. I'm afraid so, Roger. Unless... I like that, you space bugs. Give it a moment, Ken Willie. They'll be through the door in no time. Wait, Roger, I just thought of something. What? Can we get to the atmosphere station, shut it down? Hey, that cut off the air supply. Great idea, but impossible. The only entrance is underground, and the passage to it starts below this building. Again, Willie! By the rings of Saturn, we got to do something. It's hopeless. In another minute, they'll have that door down. Warden, wait. Where does the water come from to cool the air station generator? Why, the canal which runs through the compound. You can see it from here. That'd provide another entrance, then. Yes, look, Warden. We can get out this window on our rope cable, swing the canal to the station, and shut it down. Oh, I space it at work. But we 
we've only got seconds to go. Another blast like that. Boys, boys, there are chemicals in that canal. Sulfuric and other acids. You'd be burned to death. Oh, great. Warden, you must have a couple of spacesuits here. That's regulations in an artificial air zone. Well, yes, well yes. let's get them. They can stand anything but open, sustained flame. We're going swimming, Roger. Get into a spacesuit fast. <laughs> Corbett and his crew blast off into space, every man on board makes sure he carries a set of official Space Cadet goggles. Every cadet wears space goggles as protection out in space. Well, now you can get these very same space goggles. Whether you're working with tools, racing on a bike or skates, or blasting off into outer space, you want to have official space goggles with you every minute. Now, here's Tom Corbett to tell you more about official Space Cadet goggles. Spaceman? You should send for your space goggles right away, because the sooner you send in, the sooner you'll get them. You know, these aren't ordinary goggles. Space goggles are made of one sweeping curved piece of clear colored plastic, like a giant bubble that fits right over your eyes. I've been down to Space Academy Supply Headquarters, and they've got space goggles all ready to send out as soon as you let them know where to send them. So get going, spacemen. Send for your space goggles today. And here's what you do. Send 25 cents... One Kellogg's Pep Box Top and your name and address. Repeat, 25 cents, one Kellogg's Pep Box Top, your name and address. Mail to this address. Kellogg's, Box 346, Battle Creek, Michigan. Kellogg's, Box 346, Battle Creek, Michigan. A spaceman, send for your official Space Cadet goggles now. And start off tomorrow with a bowl full of Kellogg's Pep, the build-up wheat cereal. In a desperate attempt to crush a convict's rebellion on Prison Rock Asteroid, Tom and Roger decide to shut down the atmosphere station, which would end the revolt by depriving the mutineers of air. In spacesuits, they try to swim the canal, which leads to the station. But the convicts fire heat rays into the canal, setting the chemicals in the water on fire. Now Tom and Roger are engulfed in a mighty mass of flame. Tom, we're done for. Unless our suits hold out. We're in starting to sing. So's mine. Just get as low in the water as you can. In a spacesuit, that's like keeping a cork underwater. Only way, and swim. The water intake for the station isn't far anymore. Swim like blazes and play. Stood it another second. We made it, though. We're in the station. By the craters of Luna. Let's get out of this sulfuric acid suit. Better strip these space suits. Won't take long. There goes my helmet. And the suit's practically burned off me already. Where's the control panel? Over by the wall. You ready? Just about. Okay, Junior. Uh oh. Company. Willie and another rat. Dive at their feet, Roger. Don't let them use those rays. Never a dull moment. Okay, Mr. Try this for size. Sweet Willie, come to Poppy, you space crumb. How you doing, Roger? Okay, Tom. Look out, Willie. I'm lowering the boom. There goes Willie. And here goes his playmate. Well, that's over, Tom. Not yet. Get the gang outside. Where do you turn the atmosphere off? Here. Go here. Yeah. Yeah, that does it. 
Quick, put on a portable respirator. It's like I said before, Tom. Never a dull moment on this rock. Look, Roger, through the vent here. The convicts are starting to fold up. The revolt is over. Yeah, beautiful sight. But, Tom, they'll die without air. The warden and Captain Shepherds. They're just blacking out now because the air's getting thin. They won't die. Not until we can disarm the convicts and turn the atmosphere back on. Come on, Roger. We've still got work to do. Cadets Corbett and Manning, you did a splendid job and congratulations. And thanks. That goes for me too, boys. Well, thank you, sir. Now, at ease. And make yourselves comfortable. We're going to be here a while yet. Stay here? On the rock? Why, Captain? We can't get off. While you boys were at the atmosphere station, Bull Carson and Hogue got away in the Polaris. They got oh, away? No. The solar guard has been alerted, and Carson and Hogue should be intercepted soon. I hope. I hope is right. See, Junior, it's like I told you. Yes, Roger. Never a dull moment. <laughs> the next action-packed adventure of Tom Corbett, Space Cadet, on Thursday, when Tom and Roger, in peril of their lives, tangle again with the two most dangerous criminals in the universe in part two of Revolt at Prison Rock. Tune in, same time, same station, for the next thrilling interplanetary adventure with Tom Corbett, Space Cadet. Brought to you by Kellogg's Pep, the build-up wheat cereal. Tom Corbett, Space Cadet, starring Frankie Thomas, can also be seen on television and appears in the comic sections of many of America's leading newspapers. Look for it daily and in weekend editions. Featured in the cast were Jan Merlin, William Keene, James Mux, and Joseph Boland. Today's program was written by Ben Peter Freeman and directed by Drex Hines. Jackson Beck speaking. Kellogg's Raisin Bran, Raisins and Bran Flakes too. They're out of this world, they're out of one package. Kellogg's Raisin Bran. Kellogg's Raisins are honeycomb coated to keep them tender. The Bran Flakes crisper. Kellogg's Raisin Bran, Raisins and Bran Flakes too. They're out of this world, they're out of one package. Kellogg's Raisin Bran. Eat Kellogg's Raisin Bran. Eat Kellogg's Raisin Bran. Eat Kellogg's Raisin Bran. Tired of the everyday grind? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you Escape. Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You are walking the streets of an Indian city. Terrifying, sweltering streets. While the man you fear has already made his mark on you. A mark from which there can be no escape. So listen now as Escape brings you James Leal Henderson's frightening story, The Untouchable. shame about Rydell's having to go to India. It was a shame about the leprosy, too. He was a little man, balding, pale, and in his early forties. He was fussy and precise, an absolute fanatic about cleanliness. 
So you can see he was the last man on earth to send to India, even with his wife Prudence along to take care of him. Rydell and I were thrown together on a job. We met for the first time in the Hotel Imperial in Delhi. He was a chemical engineer, and I'm a construction engineer. We'd been hired separately to look over the possibilities of a chemical plant in India. It was a job I needed, needed badly. I bounced around the globe a lot. Asia's not too bad when you get to know it, but Rydell... Well, the poor guy was in misery. He was right out of a Cleveland suburb and terrorized by a germ. We had been in New Delhi a week, and I couldn't move Henry Rydell out of the hotel, even for business. He'd walled himself off and just sat brooding about India's squalor beyond the window. I'd worked my head off for the two of us, getting things set up, and then it came time to go on tour around the country and look for a plant site. I went to his hotel room one afternoon. He was standing at the open window, looking down at the street. Hello, Fred. Back, eh? Uh Uh-huh. I've been in 14 government offices. Count them, Henry, 14. But we're squared away now. Oh, boy, I'm knocked out. I'm sorry, but I just didn't feel up to going with you today. Yeah, yeah, I know. How do you feel? Take all your pills? Yes. Mm-hmm. But I'd feel a lot better if that snake charmer would stop playing that screechy pipe. It's been driving me crazy. And those cobras being so near. Ugh. And believe me, Henry, those are the sickest snakes on earth. They wouldn't bite on invitation. Well, why don't you just tell him to go away? He's filthy, Fred. I wouldn't go near him. He doesn't want to dance with you. He wants some money. Well, I'll get rid of him. Hey. Snake, Walla. Here you are, Walla. Nice fat rupee. Now, no more music. You understand? No more. Go. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we can talk, Henry. First, how about a drink? Sure, Fred. I'll have one with you. Uh, Scott? Yeah, fine. Fine. Fred, I'm afraid I've only got one glass left that's been put in boiling water. Just give me a glass, Henry. Any glass will do. You should be more careful. A British fellow was telling me yesterday... The whiskey will kill the germs, if any. Look, Henry, I know you've asked the company for a replacement, but we haven't got time to wait for them. You're going to have to go on this trip yourself. I... I... You'll have to. We made an agreement. I know, but nobody told me it was going to be like this. Nothing safe to eat. Water buffalo. Who ever heard of eating a water buffalo? And the vegetables will kill you. If no, you let's, let's, let's not hello, go through that again. Oh, hello, Fred. How are you? You look tired. Oh, hello, Prue. I am tired. Rough day. Yeah, that's a nice piece of ivory. Isn't it? Buddha. Very old. I wanted you and Henry to see it. I bought it down in the bazaar. How can you stand it down in those dirty bazaars? Oh, Henry, no. don't be silly. Uh, well, if you two are going... No, to... I'd like you to stay for a minute, if you will, Prue. I think you ought to hear this. I just told Henry that we can't stall on this trip one day longer, so I've bought two tickets for tonight's flight to Bombay. That's going to be our first stop. Tonight? Yeah. I won't do it, Fred. I, I just can't. Jumping around this terrible country, you can never tell what will happen to you. And, and what about Prudence? No, Fred, you, you've got to wait. I... Just don't feel well. We've at all. got a job to do, Henry. Now pull yourself together. Prue can't come. Accommodations are tight, and we'll probably have to travel around the sticks. It's fairly primitive sometimes. You know, it, it just won't work with her along. I'll take good care of you. We'll, we'll boil everything. We'll boil a whiskey if you insist. How long do you think it'll be, Fred? Oh, three weeks maybe, no longer. Three weeks? Uh, Henry, it'll be all over soon, and we'll be back home. Yes, but, but, but Prudence, I just don't feel right about this. I, I'm afraid. You must go, Henry. Fred's depending on you. We'll be ready, Fred. I'll pack for him. Well, we got off all right with Prudence pushing from behind. We flew down from Delhi and landed at the Bombay airport at first light. Then we climbed aboard the airline bus for the long ride through town to the Taj Mahal Hotel. Good Lord, it was hot. Vicious. The air was pure steam. Couldn't breathe. And on the walks, the homeless were beginning to stir. Thousands of them. No place to live. No place to go. The human wreckage of Asia. It is so hot. Bad. No, it is just before the monsoon. 
Well, we'll get us an air-conditioned room, Henry, a cool bath, a nice mango for breakfast. Fresh fruit? Oh, not for me. Taj is a good hotel, Henry. Bombay is pretty modern, even with all the poor you've been seeing on the streets. You'll see. Well, come on. This is it. There's a nice, cool bath waiting. Fred, look, look. What? Oh, yeah. Poor devil. Fred, look at him. What is it? I, I've never seen anything so horrible. His hands. He's a leper, Henry. Come on, he won't hurt you. Fred, don't let him touch me. Don't let him. Come on, Henry. I'm hot and I want to get out of here. Now, come on. Bakshish, what is it, man, sir? Sir. One rupee, sir. Here. Take it easy, Willem. All right, Henry, let's go. Oh, Fred, his hands. They were horrible. After seeing the leper, it was three days before I could drag Henry Rydell out of the hotel for a business meeting in town. And when I did, he clung to me like a little boy lost. But we did make some headway in our plans, and I felt more cheerful after the meeting. I talked Henry into having dinner in a Chinese restaurant a few blocks from the hotel. The place was spotless. And the food was good. Henry stoked up on rice, and I almost caught him smiling once. Then afterwards, we sauntered back to the hotel through the dark, stifling night. Well, that's the first decent meal I've seen you eat in India, Henry. It was good. I'd like to eat there again tomorrow, Fred. Sure, why not? But, of course, you never can tell. The bugs might be anywhere. I'll take some tablets when we get back to the room. Yeah, you do that. Now, you out with those bugs every time, Henry. Oh, say, look. Here's uh-huh. a store of prudence if it like. Nothing but ivory. Uh, Fred, uh, wait a moment, will you? I, I, I want to look. Uh, Master Bakshi, uh, for a sick man. I look back. Uh, that same poor devil of a leper had moved uh, out of the darkened doorway of the store and was pawing Henry. Uh, no, get away from me. Don't touch me. Please, please, no, leave me alone. Here, voila. Voila, pick him up. For heaven's sake, get away. Get away. Thank you, master. He tapped right on my skin. He touched Come out of it, Henry. Nothing's going to happen. Look. (laughs) See? Fire, no hurt. (laughs) Don't look. Come on, let's get back to the hotel. Fred, his hands. He can hold the flame to them and feel nothing. And he touched me with them. He rubbed me on the bare skin on my hands and here on my arm and wrist. I felt it, Fred. I felt it rubbing into me. Henry, believe me, you don't catch leprosy that way. Now, nothing's going to happen to I've you. got to wash. Right now, I've got to wash. <laughs> Henry washed all right, thoroughly. He washed for half an hour. This I didn't mind, but as I turned and twisted in bed through the hot blanketing night, I could hear him. Every few minutes, washing, washing. He kept it up day and night, wherever we were, washing harder and harder. He scrubbed those places on his arm and wrist with a brush until the skin was rubbed raw. For two days it went on like that, but I let it pass. I didn't say anything. I needed him for the tour, good or bad. Josh knows he wasn't worth much in that state, but he was docile. Nice and docile. Nothing seemed to bother him so long as he had a place to wash. Henry, you're clean enough for tonight. You've got to grab some sleep. If I keep at this thing, maybe I can prevent infection. If you keep at it, you'll wear your arm away. No, I figure if I just scrub down in there below the skin, I'm sure to kill it. Henry, we're pretty well finished up here in Bombay. Tomorrow I thought we'd shove off for Bangalore and look around. Sure, but... Fred, that's fine by me. Anything you say. A day there ought to be enough. And then Madras. The way things are shaping up, Madras may be the spot for the plant. Henry? Madras. I thought we'd stick around Madras about a week. Okay, Fred. Yeah. I thought you might wire Prudence and ask her to meet us there. No. No, I don't want to do that. Not now. Why, Henry? 
There's no point in it. I'd rather she stayed in Delhi until this tour is finished. She's used to it there, Fred, and there's no telling what you and I will be doing. Why, Henry? I don't want Prudence to come. That's final. All right. Just forget it. But, Henry, listen to me. Please, stop worrying about that leopard touching you. Nothing's going to happen. We will return to Escape in just a moment. But first, tomorrow night, the Lux Radio Theater brings Joan Fontaine and Charlton Heston to its microphones, co-starring in The President's Lady. It's the true scandal-ridden story of President Andrew Jackson and his wife, Rachel, with Joan in the title role and Charlton as Old Hickory. That's on the Lux Radio Theater. The same night, CBS Radio stars Mr. John Hodiak in Suspense's production of Hellfire. Yes, tomorrow night on most of these same CBS radio stations. And now, back to Escape. Madras, South India. A warm, wet wind off the Bay of Bengal. The ceaseless rustle of the cocoa palms outside our hotel. And the inevitable snake charmer with his toneless pipe. I worked hard in Madras. Maybe too hard. I didn't see that Henry was cracking up badly. But don't get me wrong. He made good sense. And on the business side, it was perfect. When I said yes, he said yes. Anything I didn't like, Henry didn't like it either. Ideal for me. He had the big reputation from the States which the Indian people wanted, and I ran the show. I was hoping to nail down a deal right there. A day or two more, and we'd be all set. And it had been a long time. A long, long time. But, as I said, poor old Henry. Coming apart. One afternoon, I was going over plans in our room. Uh, yes. Yes, I understand. Then, with the plant here, we'd have to put in a railroad siding leading somewhere through just about in here. Oh. There's room for a landing strip just to... Henry, what's the matter? Uh, nothing. What the devil are you up to? What are you doing to your arm? It, it, it's all right, Fred. Nothing. Go ahead with the plant. No, I want to say... You've been pinching yourself. Henry, for heaven's sake. I want to make sure that I can feel it when I pinch myself. Sometimes I don't. Henry, I... now, sit still and listen to me. And, and try to get this through your head. You haven't got leprosy. Oh, yes. No, but... there's not a chance in a million or even ten million that you've got it. Yes, but that man... I know, I know the leper touched you, but the disease is just not that contagious. If he rubbed you all night with his hands, you wouldn't get it. Now, take my word for it. There are exceptions, Fred. Yeah, maybe, but I doubt it. And you're not one of them anyway. Now, Henry, believe me. There's not a chance in the world of your having leprosy. And if you did, you wouldn't know it for years. But I catch things easily, Fred. I always have. And when I pinch myself here on the wrist real hard, I don't feel a thing. Honestly, up here I can feel it on my arm, so there must be something. I'm going to get a doctor. No, no, Fred. No, please. He might send me to one of those awful colonies here in India. I I might never get home. I'm going to get a doctor. No. Fred, I'd... Please, I'd... I'd believe you now. I... I I don't have it. I, I... I couldn't have it. You don't have to get a doctor. Okay, Henry. We'll let it go for now. But forget leprosy, will you? Just hang on to yourself for a few more days until we get this deal set and then everything will be fine. Did I say everything would be fine? Just how wrong can you be? I wired Prudence in Delhi and told her to hustle down to Madras on the first available plane and... Meanwhile, I just played for time, but there wasn't enough of them. Then one night I woke up when I heard Henry moving about during the quiet hours of the early morning. His bed lamp was on. <laughs> what is it, Henry? Henry, what's the matter? Oh, Fred. I have it. I'm diseased. I have... Leprosy. No. 
Go back to bed, Henry. Please. We'll talk about it in the morning. Everything will seem different in the daylight. It Come won't on. help to talk about it. I've, I've got it, that's all. I'm unclean. Fred, I'm a leper. A leper. Please. Henry, try to sleep. Oh, Fred, I, I can prove it. Watch. See? I don't feel a thing. The flesh is dead. No, stop that. Stop it, Henry. I'm diseased. A leper. An untouchable. No, you're not. You're Henry Rydell, an American businessman from Cleveland, Ohio, with an obsession. You're all right, Henry. Here. You do it, Fred. No. Here. Stick me with this. Anywhere on my lower arm. I'll show you. I don't feel it. Henry, stop it. I know. I'm diseased, but I, I Henry, won't touch you, Fred. Just stick me with a pin as deep as you want to do it, Fred. Do it. Go on. Stick me. Stick me. Stick me. Stick me. Stick me. I'm a leper. Yeah. I guess that's right. You try to sleep now, Henry. Yes. I'll sleep. I'm tired. You won't tell anyone about this. I, I, I mean a doctor or mm, anyone like no, that. No, of course it's not. It's got no. to be our secret, Fred. Not even Prudence can know. You see, they might try to send me to one of those colonies, and I couldn't stand it, Fred. Fred, you promise? I promise, Henry. Now go to sleep. When this deal is signed for you, I'll just disappear, Fred. I, I don't know where yet, but nobody will ever hear from me again. <laughs> I got up early the next morning to meet the plane from Delhi. Prudence was coming. Thank heaven she was coming. Henry was still sleeping like a stone. I left quietly, praying to get back with Prudence before he waked. I was scared, and... Well, I didn't like myself much. I had dragged Henry into this appalling mess and then let it get out of hand because I wanted that contract. I wanted to make a buck... On the way from the airport to the hotel, I tried to break Prudence in gently, but the simple fact that I and not Henry had wired her was enough to convince her that something was seriously wrong. Fred, please, you can stop beating about the bush. Just tell me, what's wrong with Henry? Well, Prudence, he has an obsession. Um, he thinks he has leprosy. Oh, no. He's not in his right mind, Prudence. You've got to be prepared for that. But, but why didn't you send for me sooner, Fred? Why didn't you? Well, he didn't want me to. He doesn't want to see me. But he's needed me so much all our lives. Uh, all I've ever done is take care of Henry. At home, I always... Prudence, now, try to understand. This isn't home. It's India. And Henry thinks he's a leper. At the hotel, Prudence and I hurried to the room. But the door was locked from the inside. Henry! Henry, open the door! It's Prudence! Henry! Henry, please open the door! I know he's in there. Oh, I want to help you, darling. Please let me in. Please! Prudence, go away. Go back home. No! No, I want to see you. Please let me in. It's no use, Prudence. Forget me. I'm unclean. Go back home. Henry! You've got to forget me, Prudence. Don't you see? I'm dead. For you, I'm dead. I'm finished. Oh, Henry. Henry Riddell is dead. I went after a doctor then, fast. Fortunately, there was one with offices right in the hotel building. Nice-looking young fellow, an Indian, dark and slender, and he wore Indian rather than European clothing. It certainly wasn't very coherent, and a perplexed expression came into his face. But he took up his kit and came along with me. We may have to force our way in, Doctor. So? Uh, this is a very strange case, Mr. McGallister. It sure is. Now, here we are. Anything happen, Prudence? No. He won't even answer me anymore. Henry! Henry! Well... Henry! I don't feel the 
fire. Part of me has died. Who's that? Fred, who's that Indian? Mr. Rydell? No. Don't you come near me. Don't. You've got it, too. You all have disease. Leprosy, leprosy, and I've got it. Get away. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. No, Fred. Don't let him touch me. Don't let him touch me. Fred. That was it. End of chapter. Dr. Padaswamy shot him full of drugs, knocked him out. A few days later, Henry Rydell left India by plane and on a stretcher, tied down, too. But Prudence was along to take care of him. And as for me, tough. I lost the contract. Deserved to, I guess. The way I treated Henry, dragging him around India in that condition. End of chapter, but not quite the end of the story. I knocked around Asia for months after that, and all the time I wondered how poor old Henry came out. But never a word. Then one day I found myself back in the States again, in Cleveland, as a matter of fact. I went out to see what had happened to him. Henry was not in a leper colony, or even an insane asylum. Henry was in front of his own house, raking leaves. He looked older, but otherwise fit enough. Funny thing, though, I said hello, and he said hello, and then he said... I have to go in now. Oh, but Henry, no, wait, wait, wait a moment. Yes? Well, I just want to tell you that I'm glad you're well again. You don't know how glad. It's a load off my mind. Henry. Henry, you remember me, don't you? Fred McAllister. Yes. I remember you. How's Prudence? Prudence is in good health, thank you. Fine. Fine. Happy to hear it. Well, um, aren't you going to... Oh. What's the matter? Nothing. I... I'm all right. Henry had grabbed his left arm as if it had suddenly been scalded and burned. And you know what it was? An ant. A tiny ant crawling on the skin. Feeling had come back to his arm all right, with a vengeance. Well, I have to go in now. Goodbye, Fred. Bye, Henry. I'm glad to see you home again. Under the direction of Anthony Ellis, Escape has brought you The Untouchable, a story by James Leal Henderson, starring John Daner as Fred and Parley Bear as Henry. Featured in the cast were Joan Denton, Jack Crucian, and Charles Davis. The special music for Escape was composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Next week... You are in your house. Surrounded by all that is secure and normal. While outside, your children are playing a new and wonderful game. The result of which will mean for you a fate from which there is no escape. So listen next week when Escape will bring you Ray Bradbury's terrifying story, Zero Hour. <laughs> night, when Arthur Godfrey beckons to the new talent scouts and their discoveries, you'll meet Ed Stroll, a popular songman, Martha Flowers, who has a way with semi-classical songs, and the Fletcher Peck Trio, as unusual a novelty group as you've heard in a long, long time. They're all potential winners on Arthur Godfrey's talent scouts. Yours for fun and human interest, tomorrow night on most of these same CBS radio stations. Be sure to hear it. Arthur Godfrey's talent scouts. 
This is Roy Rowan speaking. And remember, there's action as a policeman really finds it in 21st Precinct. Tuesdays on the CBS Radio Network. The American Broadcasting Company Radio Network presents Space Patrol! High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol! In today's transcribed Space Patrol adventure, Buzz and Happy are inside a small atmosphere shell on the planet Pluto. Outside the transparent dome, a gang of armed criminals approach in spacesuits. It's Duncan and Savage in the gang. Hey, come on. They've got to come through that airlock one by one. We can pick them off if they try to come in. Corey, this is Savage. You are trapped. Now be smart and give up. He's on our miniature space phone frequency. Savage, this is Corey. If you want us, come in and get us. Uh, don't be a fool. There are eight of us, and we got blasters. We can crack the atmosphere shell and bring that whole zone down on top of you. Smoke and rockets, Commander. What are we going to do? We'll be back in just a moment with today's exciting space patrol adventure, The Hermit of Pluto. The United States has seen many changes in the past dozen years, all pointing to a still better way of living. Billions more Americans are working, earning more, saving more. They're eating more and eating better. More young people are going to high school and college. More of us are getting paid vacations. More of us are enjoying the luxuries of life. Sports, radio, television, the theater, concerts, church attendance, and membership has climbed steadily upward. In addition to these material and spiritual changes have come the miracles of jet propulsion, supersonic flight, antibiotics. All these changes have produced tremendous needs. We need factories, and machinery needs modernizing to increase our output of electric power. Our current needs add up to greater employment and investment opportunities for practically everyone in America. The better you know America, the better the future looks. Write for the free booklet, The Future of America, Box 1776, Grand Central Station, New York 17. Now today's Space Patrol adventure, The Hermit of Pluto. Commander Corey and Cadet Happy are on a special mission to Pluto, outermost planet of the solar system. Forty times as far from the sun as the planet Earth, Pluto is a dark and frozen world. The gases that would be its atmosphere lie in a solid coating like ice upon its surface. In Pluto's black sky, the remote sun appears as a large flaming star. The population of Pluto City is protected from the cold airlessness of space by a thin atmosphere shell. Beneath this huge transparent bubble, life goes on as it does on Earth or Terra or Mars. It is not quite the same as Buzz and Happy are observing as they walk down a dimly lighted street of the city. Gee, Commander, why don't the city commissioners do something about those lights? This is the biggest city on Pluto, and yet we can hardly see where we're going. In lots of ways, Happy, this is still a pioneer community. Yeah, and from the looks of the buildings in this neighborhood, maybe it's just as well that the streets aren't too well lighted. Pluto is still a frontier planet, Happy. 
Uh oh. Hey, it, it looks like a fight. No. Hey, Commander, look, it's two against one. They're sure slugging that guy. Come on, half. Yes, sir. We should have brought our ray guns. All right, break it up. Oh, hey, come back here. I'm a dirty coward. Shall I go after him, Commander? Let's take care of this man. He may be hurt. I don't wonder the way they were hitting him. Here, let me help you. Thanks. Those two guys sure disappeared fast. Get him under a light, see if he's there. I'm all right. Thanks. I'm sure glad you came along. What was it all about? You know, a couple of thugs jumped out of the doorway and started slugging me. It's getting so a man can't walk down the street without some hooting. Why, you're Sam Morris. Yeah, that's right. Huh? Oh, Commander Corey. You two were space patrollers, but the light was so bad I couldn't... Happy, this is Sam Morris. Sam, Cadet Happy. How do you do, Mr. Morris? Howdy, Cadet. Sam, better let us take it to a doctor at headquarters. Oh, no, thanks. I'm all right. You've got quite a slugging from those characters. I'm fine. Well, it's sure nice to see you again, Commander, but if you'll excuse Are me... Are you still prospecting, Sam? Oh, now and then. Right now, I'm more or less of a watchman, you might say. Here in Pluto City? No, no, several hundred miles north of here. Guess you might call me a, a license. Water. You're a watchman? Well, what's there to watch that far north on this planet? Well, just some government equipment. It's in an atmosphere shell. Used to be a base for some government explorers, mining engineers, and the like. I sort of take care of the equipment until the government decides what they want to do with it. Well, thanks for the rescue, Commander. Oh, wait a minute, Sam. You've had a pretty rough going over there. Oh, I'm okay. These fellas hadn't taken me by surprise. I could have handled them both. Oh, they sure ruined your clothes. Look, your jacket's all ripped. The pocket's torn off. Oh, it's an old thing, anyway. I got a couple of licks in there, remember. Are you sure you don't know who they are? No, of course not. Just a couple of Pluto City thugs. They knew how broke I was, they wouldn't have bothered. Oh, I've got to run along now. Thanks a lot, Commander. You too, Cadet. Uh, glad you had met you, Mr. Morris. Hey, Sam, wait a minute. Well, i got to run along now. I'm late for an appointment. See you around, Commander. Yeah. I should put that beating pretty lightly. In the way he acts, you'd think this was something that happened to him every day. I have a feeling there's more to this than just an attempted hold up. Well, we'd better go on about our business, Happy. Oh, what's this? Oh, I'll flash my thumb away, sir. Money. A whole lot of it. Hard bills, too, mostly fit for credit notes. And here's a card. A business card of some kind. Maybe along the Mars. Hey, the commander, didn't he say he was broke? Yes, I can. Shine your light in this card, man. Yes, sir. John Harbach, mineralogist, expert testing and analysis, 412 North and Bromley Street, Pluto City. I just heard me have dropped out of Morris's jacket when those guys threw him pocket. Yeah. After we take care of our business, we'll drop him in Harbach to see if he knows where Morris is staying. Then you think this money belongs to him? Even when he claims to be broke? Not at night. Huddles like Morris always say they're broke. Keeps people from getting curious about their prospect to get his money. Yeah, but why would he fib to you? Well, just to keep him practicing. Man. If this money does belong to Mars, I'm sure he'll be glad to get it back. Hang on to that card, Happy. We'll drop it on the Harbach on our way back. At this hour, Andromeda Street, like the rest of this section of Pluto City, is almost totally dark. Buzz and Happy walk toward a pool of violet light that streams across the sidewalk from the shop window. Well, this is 412, Commander. That's the only place in the street with a light on. Well, we're in luck. Uh oh. Light went out. There's one on inside, here in the back. It's locked. I guess how about they're just leaving. That's why the light in the window went in. It's automatic ultraviolet light, huh? Look in the window. Oh, there's rocks. They're glowing. It's fluorescent. They absorb ultraviolet rays and radiate them in the dark. Oh, the rocks sure are pretty. <laughs> but they're wasted on this street. It's completely deserted. We well, got here too late, huh? How about. Look inside. See that choking? It's choking. Looks like someone's lying there on the floor. Our buck must have been robbed. What a neighborhood. Of the door, Hattie. Yes, sir. <coughs> I'll turn on the light, Commander. All right. He's getting cut. He's getting away from that shattered choking. Yes, sir. Don't hit me. No, it's all right. We're space patrollers. Oh. I thought they were still here. Who attacked you? These two men. I never saw him before. They came in just as I was closing the shop. Are you John Harbaugh? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, really mm-hmm. I sure thought it was a part. Is the safe lock? It's supposed to be. I'll check. <laughs> mm, that's relief. I didn't get it open. If I was 
Elvis is the best over there. They seem to be more interested in your record. You know why? No. Well, not exactly. What do you mean, not exactly? What happened here? Well, like I said, these two men came in just as I was closing. They wanted me to run a test on a piece of cloth. A piece of cloth? Yeah, I thought it was strange myself, me dealing with minerals. But it turned out there were traces of minerals in the fabric. That's what they were interested in. Well, this cloth, did they say where they got it? No, but it looked like it was torn off a man's coat or jacket. A pocket, maybe? Yeah, that's it. They had me put it in an ultrasonic chamber to loosen the dust. Then I ran an analysis of the particles that came out of the cloth. And after that, they got left. Why? Right. They wanted some information about one of my customers, and I wouldn't give it to him. Well, this customer, is his name Sam Morris? Yes. How did you know? He was attacked by two men earlier this evening. Did you hurt? I just bruised a little. After we went away, the cadet and I found one of your business cards on the sidewalk. That's why we came here. Why were these men interested in Morris? On account of a storm light, I guess. Storm light? And there were traces of stone light and the dust particles from the piece of cloth, probably from the samples Morris brought here to have us a stone light. It's a very rare and valuable method. Mm. Morris made a strike, huh? And I make it a policy not to ask questions of my customers, but that, if that's a reasonable conclusion. Then you wouldn't tell these men about Morris. They slugged you and went through your records. Is that right? Yes. Do you know where we can contact Morris? No, Commander. He never told me anything about himself. I guess he's sort of a hermit. Very secretive. Did he mention an abandoned government station north of Pluto City? No. Maybe one of those men did. Let's see if I can remember what was said. But after I analyzed the cloth and mentioned Stonelight, one of the men said that. So that's why Morris has been holding up at that old exploration base when the other man made him shut up. Do you remember anything else? No. Well, wait a minute. One of them said. Morris is probably all alone in that shell, and there are eight of us. Captain, you better find Morris right away. Yes, sir. Now, now that these cooks know that he's got... Yeah. Hmm? If uh, someone is going to speak up in this shop, it's got a place to be put in. Want me to go over and get the picture? Yeah, turn off the lights and stay with the How about don't look out the window for the lights on? All right, man. See? Yeah, but not very clear. He's carrying off down the street, huh? Right? Tell him, huh? I'll take Harbach to headquarters. He'll be safe in there. We'll keep in touch to the miniature space of him. Half an hour later, Commander Corey leaves the Pluto City Space Patrol headquarters in a surface car. His receiver is tuned with special miniature space of phone frequency. Get a happy call to Commander Corey. Get a happy call to Commander Corey. Corey here. Go ahead, Hap. I'm on Polaris. 900 blocks there. Half a block behind the man I'm taking. What's he up to? Nothing so far, but I got a pretty good look at him. Captain Christmas. I swear he's one of the men that killed Sam Morris. I'm in a surface car about a half mile from you. I'll come by and pick him up. Okay, Lieutenant. Uh-huh. Uh-oh. Another man just stepped out of the door with me. Two of them are walking together. Probably his partner. Don't lose them, Hap. I'll be right there. I didn't have a chance to finish Harbaugh. The space patrol is in a shop. Well, if you hadn't got panicky, we could have done the job when we were there before. Well, look, there's a powder savage. Harbaugh won't be able to put the finger on us anyway. We are at Pluto City and half an hour. Yeah, but Harbaugh knows we're interested in Sam Morris. If the space patrol said Sam Hart, we... Duncan, we're being followed. Huh? Don't turn around. Just keep walking. When you turn the corner, we'll wait and let him catch up. Okay. That's close to the wall. Yeah. Look, I'm looking for somebody. Space is over that. He's going for his leg. Get me! Get me! Get your hands off of me! Oh, yeah! Get off! Oh. Could be a savage. Come on. Let's get away from him. Wait, wait a minute, Duncan. We're not going to make the same mistake as we did with Harbaugh. We're going to finish him. We'll return to Space Patrol in just a moment. Listen, kids, you know how much fun it is to be growing up. Every day there's a new thrill. Well, here's a thrill maybe you haven't tried yet. and Believe me, you'll like it. It's the fun of having enough money to get the things you want. Maybe a new bike or a camera or saving for something big like business school or college in the years to come. 
Sound good? Well, here's how you do it. Put a part of your allowance and the extra cash you earn each week into school savings. It doesn't take long to have enough to buy a real United States savings bond like Dad gets all the time. And this is important. Bonds earn money for you. Uncle Sam stands behind them, and they're safe. So start to save now at your school. Mother and Dad will be proud of you for saving part of your allowance, and you'll have the fun of seeing your own money grow. A thrifty person is usually a better citizen. And take it from me, he's a lot happier than the fellow who saves nothing and can't buy the things he needs. Remember, save regularly every week at school. Have the money for the things you want when you want it. Now back to today's Space Patrol adventure, The Hermit of Pluto. Buzz and Happy are on the planet Pluto, where they've learned that two men are using violent methods to obtain information on valuable deposits of the mineral stromolite, discovered by a prospector, Sam Morris. Using a miniature space phone, Happy has contacted Buzz in a surface car, and it's reported that he's trailing two suspects through the dark streets of Pluto City. Discovering that Happy is following them, the two men wait around the corner of a building and grab the cadet. You heard what I said, Duncan. Let's finish him. Well, look, Savage, a ray gun would put him out, and we can get away from the city. Yeah? And when he comes to, he could continue the chase. Do what I tell you. What have you guys got to be afraid of? You really must be up to something crooked. Shut up, cadet. And quit struggling or I'll break your arm. All I know about you is that your names are Savage and Duncan, and you're walking down Polaris Street. And then all of a sudden you jump me on the corner of Polaris and Sigma Streets. I told you to shut up. Go on, Duncan. Get to work. You're going to be sorry. There's a space patrol surface car on the way here now. Uh, you're bluffing, Savage. One of those miniature space phones hanging on his belt. He's been mentioning the street name. That gadget's turned on. Then we got to work fast. Get into the car now. Trying to sneak up with the lights out. Help me hold it to that. We'll drag him down to the alley. Come on. Get moving, Cadet. Hold it, you two. Commander. It's glory. Let's get out of here. Use your ray gun. Let them have it. Oh, you don't? Get your hands up. Get the cadet out of here, Corey. We got both of them, Duncan. That's it, Corey. The whole neighborhood will be full of space patrols in a few minutes. Yeah. And that's why we can't go running through the streets. Get into the car. But savage. Don't argue. Get into the car, quick. Okay. We'll take the car a block from the spaceport. Come on, get in. A few moments after Duncan and Savage roar away in the commander's surface car, another space patrol car rushes to the scene to find Buzz and Happy unconscious on the sidewalk. Slightly more than an hour later in Pluto City headquarters, Buzz checks with space control, then turns to Happy. Two ships class of our problems under the effects of the ray gun. Huh? One of them was Sam Morris. And Savage and Duncan were in the other. Very likely. The second ship was registered to H.D. Margolis. So far, our agents haven't been able to locate anyone by that name here in Pluto City. Hmm. Well, it could be an alias of either Duncan or Savage, I think. Yes. The service car I was using. One of our men found it abandoned and blocked in the spaceport. Well, if they try to land at any other spaceport, we'll have to. The trouble is they know it. I figured they're desperate enough to go right after Sam Morris. You got to tip Morris off? We can't reach him by space, I suppose. Now, my dear Morris is back at that abandoned station working his time. Oh, with Savage and Duncan, I think he's in a dangerous spot. To save his life, we've got to find Morris and persuade him to stay in a safe place until we capture those two cutthroats. Now, come on, let's get to the spaceport. On an northward course, the Terra 5 arcs over the frozen surface of Pluto toward the tiny atmosphere shell 900 miles from Pluto City. Through the infrared viewscope, Buzz and Happy scan the terrain beneath them. According to the charts, the shell is just a few miles ahead. Yes, but I want to be sure there's no activity on the ground there. If Duncan and Savage planned to surprise Morris, they'd have to use an overland approach. Maybe Morris isn't at the shell. He hasn't answered any of our space phone calls. Yeah, maybe our prospect He could be purposely ignoring us. Doesn't he realize we're trying to help him? He's very stubborn and suspicious. Now that he's found some strollerite, he's probably twice as cautious. Say, Commander, does living all alone and out of the way places make people a little uh, peculiar? Or, or are they peculiar to begin with? Men like Morris are a lot more self reliant than most people have been. When Morris acts in a way you think is strange, just remember that his behavior has helped him survive in a very rugged environment. That's interesting. What could you spoke to? Spaceship? No. There's a place down there where a spaceship might have landed. See that dark spar on the surface of the planet between those two peaks? Yes, sir. 
The only place in this whole region where the ground isn't completely covered with frozen atmosphere. Mm. A ship straight to clean when it landed, huh? Yeah, I think the heat from the rocket exhaust did it on the blast star. After we contact Mars, we'll come back and search this whole region. Vendicori aboard Terra 5, calling Sam Morris at Pluto Exploration Base 5. Vendicori to Sam Morris, urgent. Please acknowledge. As the Terra 5 continues northward, two men watch the ship from inside a small atomic-powered tank hidden in a narrow ravine, half a mile from the scarred ground. You think they spotted us, Savage? I don't think so. This tank is camouflaged to blend with the frozen air. We're lucky. Harkness blasted off in our ship just in time. Boy, this be heading for the atmosphere, sir. Yeah. Uh, contact the other tank and we'll move on. You aren't going to move in on Morris now, are you? Why not? Corey's still there. When we arrive, we can finish him, too. That's likely to be quite a job. Ah, yeah, it won't be. Corey's ship will be outside the shell. And with two tanks and eight men on our side, anyone inside the shell will be at our mercy. Face upon the other tank. Let's move forward. There's the shell, Commander. Yes. That's Morris's ship just outside the airlock. There's no other ship in sight. Morris must be there alone. I'll try once more before the land. Benacori aboard Terra 5, calling Sam Morris at Pluto Exploration Base 5. Sam, if you read me, acknowledge this is urgent. Morris, Benacori, what do you want? Where are you? Inside the shell? Yeah, I'm pretty busy. You're in serious danger. I've got to talk to you in person. Somebody may be picking up this space phone conversation. Well, all right. You'll have to land outside the shell. This boat doesn't have a space line. Yes, I know. We'll set down near your ship. Hurry out. Inside the small atmosphere shell of the exploration base, Buzz and Happy quickly tell Sam Morris of their encounters with Duncan and Savage. As the prospector listens without comment, stroking his chin reflectively. This is serious, Morris. But let us take you away from here right away. Uh, nothing doing, Commander. I know my rights. Those crooks aren't going to run me off. I'm sure you're in the right, Mr. Morris, but you're all alone, 900 miles from Pluto City. You won't lose out on your claim to the scroll light, I guarantee it. Well... Well, I'm not taking any chances. You're taking plenty of chances by staying here. Now, look, Morris, you're here as an official government watchman, but whatever you find under the ground, that's yours by right of discovery. Are you sure of that? Of course. We're only trying to help you, Mr. Morris. Well, I don't know. I figure a man's got to stand his ground on his own. The minute you let somebody do you a favor, you start wanting something in return. Believe us, Mr. Morris, we only... Uh-oh. Matter, look out there. Do the atmosphere here. There's your answer, Morris. Yeah. In space, he's climbing out of tanks. Savage, I reckon in the gun. Have you got any weapons here? Ray gun. They've got to come through that airlock one by one. We can pick them off if they try to come in. Corey, this is Savage. Listen to me. You're trapped. Turn Morris over to us and save your skin. Hear that, sir? He's on our miniature space upon frequency. Yes, I heard. Savage, if you want us, come in and get us. That's telling him, Commander. Don't be a fool, Corey. There are eight of us and just three of you. We've got blasters. You're right by the airlock. Come on in. You think I'm crazy? All we got to do is fire our blasters at this atmosphere shell. It will crack, and the whole zone will fall in on you. Oh, not a minute. We wouldn't stand a chance, even in our space suit. Yes, and Morris is in every space suit. I'll give you two minutes to make up your mind, Corey. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We don't have any actual weapons, so we'll have to improvise them. We're out of what? We've only got two minutes. That big cone over there isn't got a heat projector? Yes, but it's not a very strong one. We wouldn't penetrate their spacesuits at this distance. We'll have to. Come on, let's turn around and focus it towards Savage and his men. I tell you, it's not going to do any good. I won't do any more than melt that frozen atmosphere outside the dome. That's exactly what I want. This is a major test, isn't it? Sure, but I don't see what good just what. <laughs> I will just focus the heat beam at their feet. It's not doing anything, sir. Like Morris says, it isn't strong enough. It's nothing that's frozen there on the ground. Oh, the just waiting around in puddles of liquid air. Corey, cut off the heat beam. Cut it off or I'll order my men to fire at the dome. I can tell from here that you've got one of those Mark 6 heat projectors. It's could be the big post of distance, sir. He's 
right, Commander. They're just waiting in liquid air, and it's not much more than ankle deep. Yeah, that's fine. Now we get shut the heat off. <laughs> Might as well quit stalling, Corey. All right, Savage. The heat's been shut off. Come in the airlock. Ah, you're being smart. All right, man. Corey's giving up. Into the airlock. Really? You aren't just giving up without a fight. I don't think a fight would be necessary. All right, man. You are me. Get going. Let's... I... I can't. Oh, Duncan. Come here and put me out of here. I can't. I can't. We all are. Hey, the, the air is frozen solid again around their legs. If you finish us, what's going to happen to you? You'll stand there, rooted in frozen air for the rest of your lives. He's right, Savage. Every one of us is stuck. If you blast that dome in on Corey, we'll never get out. Corey, maybe you can terrify yourself. But there's the cadet and Maury. You aren't going to stretch the fight them just to keep us trapped here. Commander, he's raising his glass now. Savage, if you bring this dome down on us, what are those seven pals of yours going to think of you? Sir, what do you mean? The air supply of those suits isn't going to last indefinitely. It will the heating units. Then you men are going to start thinking about how they got into this predicament. They'll realize they're doomed and they'll hate you. You're all armed, Savage. The first man to start gasping for breath or the first man to feel himself growing numb with cold. What's he going to be thinking about you? He'll be just a few feet away with an easy range of his blast gun. This is good, Savage. Put down that gun or I'll blast you myself right now. Yeah. What do you mean to drop their weapons? That's it. Pap, I'll cover you while you go out to the airlock and pick up those guns. Uh, they, they sure didn't need any urgency. Uh, I guess they all got the uh, cold feet. Ah! Oh! A preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure in just a moment. Did you know that thousands of bright, alert girls are choosing nursing as a career today? And did you know that despite this high enrollment, we need still more and more nurses? Well, these are facts. Facts that young women about to embark on careers should know and heed. Today, the advantages of enrolling as a student nurse are many. She receives a fine professional education, working under the supervision of skilled doctors and nurses in well-equipped classrooms and laboratories. She serves humanity, enjoys a pleasant dormitory life, and upon completing her three-year course, is eligible to become a graduate nurse. After this... Countless interesting fields are open to her. Best of all, she's well prepared for marriage. If you're a high school graduate or a college student in good health, consider nursing as a career and go to your nearest hospital to learn how you can become a nurse. Help meet this year's quota of student nurses. Now a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure. A criminal scientist has discovered a method of traveling back through time. He's taken Buzz and Happy back 14 centuries and has left them on a desolate sea coast on the planet Earth. Hey, Commander. I just can't realize that we're back in the year 1591. Let's make the best of it. After all, our ancestors did. You mean we're stuck here in the past forever? Well, Happy, there's one slight chance of getting back. Well, well what is it, Commander? Hey, Andrew, I feel strange. Everything's going well. What's that sound? I don't know. I feel like I'm floating. Hey, Commander, what's happening to us anyway? You... Hey, Commander, where are you? Be with us next week for the thrilling Space Patrol story, The Time Pirates. Space Patrol, created by Mike Moser, starring Ed Kemmer as Commander Torrey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston, produced and directed by Larry Robertson, executive producer, Helen Moser. Other players were Bela Kovach, Norman Jolly, and Ken Mayer, Dick Wesson speaking. Don't forget to tune in next Saturday at the same time for exciting adventure on Space Patrol! This program was broadcast to our armed forces overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Space Patrol came to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. <laughs>